Okay, so welcome back everyone. The first session in the afternoon is a panel discussion on citizen participation. This session is moderated by Professor Cho Hua Mei from National Sun Yat-sen Universities. And speakers include Professor Du Wenling and uh, Ms. Sho Lin and Dr. Rodrigo and also Dr. Thomas Poon. Okay, so uh, please welcome Professor Cho. Uh, hello, good afternoon. <laughs> uh, um, I'm very glad uh, to have this op opportunity to be the moderator of this uh, panel. And, and uh, I think we have already talked a lot, a lot of uh, citizen participation in the uh, past one and a half days. So um, I think for this session, we will uh, move forward to uh, focus on more uh, cases and all our panelists uh, experiences uh, in uh, Lagos experiences in facilitating uh, different kinds of uh, uh, different type of uh, citizen participation uh, forum so uh, I think uh, we would uh, later we will have uh, Wen Lin uh, Wen Lin will give us uh, her experiences in uh, where uh, cases like uh, uh, New K West citing uh, process and also some cases in coast, North coastal area, Northern coastal area of Taiwan. And she will show, she will show us how we can look at uh, New K West, the, the issue of New K, uh, face, facing out of New K power plants and also the new possibility for renewable energy in same area. And for Xiong Lin, and she from uh, Italy on work for, she's a manager uh, of uh, any energy and uh, net zero strategy department. And <laughs> Xiong, uh, she is, uh, she, she, she has uh, went through some very unique uh, projects in Taiwan, uh, including participates in uh, the, the producing process of energy transition white paper, and also the environment and uh, um, environment and the social checklist for and for re renewable energy projects in in south or oh, coastal area in southern. Uh, Western Taiwan. And then we will go to Rodrigo and he will also introduce his project and show us why, uh, how an emerging technology like uh, air carbon capture, this kind of new technology, uh, what, how uh, different the stakeholder or the society look at this new te technology and how it provoke conflict and how to deal with it by involve more citizen participants to deal with this kind of issue. And our last panelist, uh, uh, Professor Bruin, would uh, speak for us from heart. <laughs> she. He is a psychologist, so, so he says uh, he, he will look at your mind. <laughs> so he wants to be the last panelist and give us um, some, uh, I think it will be very uh, valuable insights uh, to, to talk about the importance of facilitating and uh, how like a social relationship all kind of this kind of uh, cultural and uh, psychology dimension can affect public engagement. So uh, please give a big hand to our panelists. Uh, well, I think we will uh, start from Professor Wenlin Du. Wenlin. Thank you very much. So I think my role is to uh, share uh, our experience uh, in dealing with uh, uh, energy transition. Uh, especially uh, on the public uh, participation. So, okay. 
So when we talk about uh, energy transition, it's not only about uh, to phase out uh, the old energy, such as coal and gas, or nuclear, but it's also, uh, you know, it's about a kind of transform to the new uh, renewable energy. But it's not only about energy production, it's also about uh, the system change uh, from the centralized system to decentralized system, from the uh, te technocratic control, uh, central distributive service to a more self-generated uh, energy, democratic, negotiation process. So uh, I would say uh, the change of energy uh, generation, uh, it's also about uh, energy independency or uh, energy democracy that local community can be benefited from being involved in the energy production. So it also means that we need um, the different infrastructure support um, to support the distributive energy. So um, let me um, take an example that uh, what we, you know, that study in uh, the northern coast of Taiwan. So uh, look at this map. Uh, in the northern coast of Taiwan, there have been uh, two nuclear power plants uh, since late uh, 1970s. So the local residents has been long involved uh, in the anti-nuclear movement. And finally, uh, these years, that here comes the post-nuclear power era. And, um, and now the two nuclear power plants are in their decommissioning stage. So without the nuclear power uh, from this map, you can also see a lot of potentials with other energy sources in this area, such as um, the wind power, solar power, uh, or geothermal. So the development of the new, uh, renewable energy brought new possibilities for the local to reset the, uh, the, the community, to reset uh, the relationship between the community and uh, energy development. So in the past, um, that you can imagine that the local communities have forced to take nuclear power plants in the neighborhood and were left out by the decision-making process. Um, and now in the democratic era, public participation is not only um, the norm that would le legitimize the decision-making process, but it's also a way to incorporate local wisdoms to generate new ideas and enrich the possibilities for the new energy development that would be beneficial to the local community. So to involve the public, in this particular energy transition process, we need to deal with uh, you know, two things. The one is that kind of the division of uh, nuclear power plants also raised the urgency of nuclear waste siting issue. It's very difficult to find a final disposal site uh, for the nuclear waste. But without uh, solving the uh, nuclear waste siting issue, uh, it's also uh, it's also, you know, the reality is decommissioning uh, literally become impossible. So the Central uh, for Innovative Democracy, uh, the organization I serve as a director, was commissioned uh, by the National non nuclear Homeland Committee to de design the social communication process for nuclear waste siting. And um, so considering the policy uh, stage, most people accept uh, the impact the community uh, around the nuclear power plants are not really familiar or care about the nuclear waste. However, the social tension rises um, uh, during the power shortage time or the uh, political election. So uh, CID uses um, a lot of um, the techniques um, create a variety set of material to design informed public participation process uh, based on the different goal setting uh, for each, uh, different events. So the overall goal is to um, raise awareness uh, or you know, create a common vision that how to deal with the nuclear waste issues. So in this slide, you can see um, the different interactions among different stakeholders 
um, in intentionally designed uh, by the CID you know, to, to address uh, the different goal of the meetings, such as you know, cre uh, increase the mutual understanding or, you know, in, uh, or create the social imaginary uh, and, um, and also you know, like learning from the life experience uh, from the local group. So different, uh, you know, different events have a different goal setting. But I also like to um, it's a highlight uh, the the kind of the last photo that uh, we cooperate with um, uh, the Taipei Fine Art Museum and Taiwan STS community to create uh, the negotiation theater in Taipei Fine Art Museum that will engage the public to uh, to aid uh, you know like uh, the non-human actors in the old discussion. Uh, of the the no new uh, uh, the no new uh, holding committee meeting, so it's a kind of new in, uh, kind of create the new perspective in the kind of old dialog discussion. And um, the second thing is about the, the acceptance of energy tra uh, transition, which involves the understanding of a new technology regarding its risk and opportunity. So the new energy is to introduce to the local community when the distributive generation become a trend. An introduction of renewable energy is often based on the nature setting uh, of the local. So in the northern coast of Taiwan, it's also a potential site for geothermal as it sits in a volcano area with many hot spring local business. However, each energy development has its pro and cons. So it's not always leads to the optimal result if most people do not uh, foresee the change can bring the better future. Uh, so how to make the energy transition right to the local community to meet the community needs and how to help the community to, community to access the new energy proposal and make the better choice based on the community interest and how to make the community people to be an active part uh, of the energy transition process. I think it certainly involves um, in creating a new relationship between the energy and the community and further brainstorm the innovative way of community engagement to create new possibilities and interest for the community. So that comes to my uh, um, the, the final slide. Um, I think the energy transition requires um, the system change, systematic change, and the social collaboration. But we hope that the social acceptance of energy transition comes from mutual learning and understanding about the new opportunities and uh, social welfare for the community, not uh, from the policy coercion for, uh, for the single energy production goal. So good public participation process can help social trust, uh, uh, trust building you know, for the people to match the common um, goal and create the chances for every involved stakeholder to think about, uh, think out of the box and find out the innovative way um, collective, collectively. However, how to design a good public participation process is the specialized knowledge itself. Given the complexity of energy transition, and uh, the threshold of technology de development, um, I think um, the, pa uh, the participation process will involve a lot of uh, knowledge translation and the transdisciplinary communication. So to get stakeholders involved and make a full contribution require the social trust that the procedure will lead a common interest and a better future. So, um, in the end, um, I'd like to highlight, as I uh, write in my title, um, the role and expertise of public participation expert as uh, the knowledge broker, as uh, the pop, uh, policy entrepreneur, and the social trust builder. The role in creating the mutual learning process and the cross-border understanding is indispensable for energy democracy and the just transition. Thank you. Thanks, uh, 
uh, I think Wenning gave us a very informative uh, uh, talk in such a short time, and she and um, her team shows us the we as academic uh, workers, we can be the knowledge broker and to bring engage more uh, citizens to participate in the process of energy transition. So now I will pass microphone to uh, Xiao Juan Lin, and she will, uh, she will show uh, uh, another case he, she involved and is in a national wide scale and it's especially how they produce an energy transition white paper. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sho from ETRI, and uh, our organization is a policy think tank that works closely with the government. And we position ourselves as the bridge between the civil society and the government aiming to channel public opinions into policies. And today I picked this case to add some diversity into uh, all the cases we have today. Um, I want to talk about what happened before, during, and after energy transition white paper. And finally, I will give a reflection of the whole process. Um, so back in 2016, the current government, I see Dr. Zhao shaking his head. Uh, he was originally in the very beginning of the planning of the process. Um, and, and I'm eternally grateful for that. Um, so back in 2016, when the current government was elected, uh, this current energy policy was put into place. And as you can see in the yellow box, energy transition white paper was positioned as a implementation measure to carry out uh, the policy target uh, with a set of action plans. And the goal is to have the government and the civil society working together to produce this white paper. And back in 2016, the former premier Lin Chen uh, picked this topic to, as an example uh, for citizens' participation in policy making. So then uh, the government agencies were really uh, required to, working, to work together on this project. And before the procedures were designed, our team uh, has been in constant dialogue with civil society organizations in different regions. And their expectations on policy making uh, is to first, uh, early engagement, having dialogues before you make the final decision, come talk to me. And the second is to have quantified goals and action plans that you can track. The third is always to have a long-term view in mind when you're making policies. And the fourth is they want to see government agencies working together and really be aware of what each other is doing. And uh, finally, also to make more information public during uh, decision-making processes. So having that in mind, uh, the drafting process of energy transition white paper was designed and it has three phases. The first phase is uh, openly asking for people's input to decide the scope of white paper, what goes into energy transition white paper under the current policy target. And the second phase is for the experts task force uh, to come uh, to, come to um, meetings and incorporate co public ideas into uh, action plans, uh, which was made into the draft version of white paper. And in a third phase, this draft version was given to the public in citizen dialogues uh, for public input. And the final stage, uh, experts task force came back together again to uh, use the public inputs to finalize the white paper. So this is the preliminary meetings happened uh, in four regions in Taiwan. And I think it took about, uh, uh, about, about a year or so uh, to finish. 
And uh, during the second phase, which is the task force, we have uh, five different groups. And task forces are uh, co-chaired by one representative from civil society organizations and one representative from the government side in order to balance the opinions and to be able to clarify policy situations real time. The third phase is citizen dialogue. Uh, the upper part of the slide, you can see two photos. There were two meetings, each for 100 people. Uh, there was a drawing to mirror the demographic of Taiwan uh, by uh, gender, education, background, by uh, region, and from uh, urban or rural area. So uh, for a moment, we were really devastated because we couldn't find people who want to register, uh, who are over 60 who live in the southern part of Taiwan from rural area. So we were making a lot of phone calls. And I remember I was calling this lady at a local uh, administration office and I was asking her, hey, can you give me your email address so I can send you the meeting information? And she said, no, I don't have an email. And I said, how about fax? And she said, what is fax? And at that moment, I realized I was doing something very wrong. And uh, I should have, you know, mailed her the meeting information and post her and then make a phone call to check that she got the information. Uh, so we changed our strategy. We started to hit local markets and talk to people uh, who sell fruits, who sell noodles, jewelry, lottery. And, and adding them on social media as well to send them information so they can pass that on to their friends. Um, in order to have enough uh, people who want to participate and make the composition. Uh, so a lot of lessons learned. And then uh, for industry and civil society organizations, we each have uh, individual meetings to collect opinions. Uh, the result, we, there were over 2,000 people participated in this whole process and we collected uh, more than 1,300 uh, public opinions, which was uh, channeled into the white paper. And in total, there were 20 key programs into five areas, which was the five big groups for a task force. And in order to make the information more public, so all the public opinions can be searched online. We also used uh, Tableau, which is a tool uh, to make data visualization. So you can sort all the opinions that are related to key programs. And on the upper left side, you can see how the opinions are sorted and channeled based on the themes. And on the lower right uh, corner of the slide, you can see we also track the meeting time to see how much time people spend on talking about key programs or procedural issues or other things. And you can also see who speak the most at the meetings. So annual reporting is the uh, annual progress check and disclosure process that we collect every year to see how, if we're on the right track of the progress we're making uh, and what kind of improvement do we still need to make. So finally, I want to uh, give some reflections of the whole process. And the first one is um, even after public engagement and now you have this white paper and then you have new policy goals. And what, what do you do? Do you go back and talk to people and say, do you agree with this renew? Or um, so maybe some kind of policy realignment uh, needs to be think about. And then uh, while we're thinking about empowering the civil society, by engaging people in decision-making process. I think it's also important to think about the enabling conditions for the public sectors when we're asking the government to be able to have conversations to the civil society. Do they have the resources, skills, time, staff to do that? And the third is uh, policy evaluation. How do we hold ourselves accountable? Uh, is this policy effective and what kind of process do we need to do that? And final point, uh, doing, so now we come into the policy implementation uh, 
stage? And what kind of expectations do people expect, uh, uh, engagement do people expect um, when we're at this stage? Is it the same level of engagement? Is it that, uh, can you let me know once a year uh, basis? So uh, that kind of thing is something I think it's also uh, worth thinking about. So that's all for me today. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, it's quite complicated, complicated uh, process as you can learn from, from uh, Lin. So uh, I, I guess I should pass, we should pass the microphone to uh, Rodrigo and he will show uh, experiences from, from Germany. Thank you so much. Yeah, so today I want to talk about uh, our project that is called Dextor. And our project focuses on the acceptance of carbon capture and storage technologies for net zero transition. Um, why we need carbon capture and storage is because um, to reach 1.5 degrees, the IPCC has calculated that all the scenarios would require some sort of carbon dioxide removal. Uh, the more we delay the emissions reductions, the more carbon capture we need. However, we would be in a mistake if we believe that carbon capture technologies are the solution uh, to our problems. We need to drastically reduce emissions and use carbon uh, capture technologies for the sectors that are hard to abate. And this means that um, we would use this technology to capture the emissions, for example, from agriculture, from steel production or cement production. Um, in the uh, strategy, the, the net zero strategy of Taiwan, um, these technologies are also included. So we see this in the, as one of the, the 12 key strategies. This is the sixth uh, key strategy. So it means that not only Germany is, is considering these technologies, but many other countries are doing it. Um, and for Taiwan, the, the demonstrations are to be done by 2030 and finished in 2050. And the target for 2030 is to capture around 1.76 to 4.6 million tons and uh, also establish a platform for engagement. Um, so coming now to the Daxtor project, it started in October 2022. And uh, the name of the project is uh, Direct Air Capture and Storage Project. And um, it's basically a cooperation of seven German research institutes. Several of them are parts of uh, Helmholtz and the Climate Service Center Germany belongs to one of the Helmholtz centrums, so, so to Herion, it's there in the middle. And we're cooperating with the other uh, six uh, research centers and we meet uh, every six months, all of us, and we hear about the, the advances of the other centers and we share information and we also invite the industry. We had uh, our first meeting in April this year and the industry was present. This means that the industry was already ge uh, ge getting information straight from science. These type of Im images, I know they're super confusing when you first see them, but what I want to show here is we have four sub-projects. So it means four uh, working uh, forces. Um, and these working forces have several objectives. So some of them are researching the technology. How can we make uh, carbon capture technologies more efficient? So um, the chemicals used to, to bind CO2 from the air, they're being researched. Uh, they're doing also life cycle assessments uh, for the technology. Um, we're also uh, ch uh, checking in Germany what is the capacity of the country to store CO2, how much CO2 can be stored uh, on the ground, and where exactly would this be. And uh, we also have a group that is focusing on laws, developing uh, better laws uh, for, and regulations for the implementation of these technologies. And also, we have the transformational study. So the sub-project three, which is the one we are participating in. And within this project, we are analyzing the acceptance 
of these technologies. As you see, we have a combination here of natural sciences and, and uh, social sciences together. And why are we looking at acceptance is really easy because of this. Because in the past, 10 years ago or uh, around 12 years ago, the first demonstration projects in Germany ended up uh, sparking massive demonstrations and opposition against uh, carbon capture and storing storage technologies. So these uh, projects were, were proposed by the industry and uh, the concerns of the population in these areas where, where CO2 was going to be stored were very much based on fear. So the rhetoric, the speech that was used in those years, it was, it was bomb, explosion, leakage, and earthquake. So as you can see in these two images, you see one from Greenpeace and it says time bomb CO2. Um, Sorry, I, just, I forgot the, the word in English. To um, the storage. Yeah, so it says a, it's, a, it's a time bomb of the CO2 storage. And it says, please uh, stop the CO2 uh, storage. And these are two initiatives. So one is from the, the, the one on the top is from, from the people in this region. They created this uh, initiative where they bound together to uh, express their opposition. And the other one was uh, Greenpeace doing some some demonstrations. So the other issue that we have back then is that there was a lack of legislation. So the companies couldn't start their projects because there was no law. And eventually CO2 storage became illegal in Germany. There was also a lack of trust, which was uh, in the main driver behind social opposition. And we see this not only in Germany, which we see it in, let in literature of um, studies that have, have been done in many other countries the main issue driving uh, the opposition is the lack of trust. In this case, they didn't trust the um, private sector, which was the industry doing these projects. And what happens when, you, when, when people don't lack, when, when people don't trust the, 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 the stakeholders, it means that it increases the risk, risk perception. So the risks are seen as, as more, as, as bigger as what they are, and it reduces the benefit perception. So it doesn't have any benefits for them. It only has risks. Um, we also have seen, and it's also confirmed by literature, that information is not enough. We cannot just give information to people and ex expect them to accept uh, a project that has been decided by other people. Um, everybody wants to have a saying in what it's done in their surroundings. And um, yeah, so the, the, the public opinion has to be therefore included in the decision making process because it gives stakeholders the opportunity to share their concerns and exchange with policymakers, the industry and science. So for this, we are planning, first of all, uh, a survey. We want to interview as many people as possible in Germany through an online survey. And afterwards, we're gonna organize a series of workshops in, in which we will include uh, the industrial sector, um, the private sector, the population, et cetera, et cetera. And after these several workshops, we will do a, a workshop where we will bring all these groups together to talk. And the goal is to understand what exactly do people fear, what exactly do they need, and how can we solve these issues so we can uh, keep promoting CO, CO2 capture. Um, and one of the... Of, uh, I want to return a little bit just to, to the image related to the project. The way in this project is, is, is structured is because we're trying to solve several of the, of the limitations of, of CO2 storage. This was one question that was asked yesterday to our director, uh, Professor Jakob, and some of the limitations is that, is that the technology can still be improved, the energy efficiency can still be increased, um, also the lack of market. It is still cheaper to just vent the CO2 into the atmosphere than capturing it. It's very expensive to capture uh, CO2 right now. It's at, at least 200 euros, two more. Um, and again, there's a lack of regulation, as I already mentioned, and uh, we have the public opposition. So also um, one quote uh, that uh, Professor Ren yesterday told us is, um, that I really, really liked, and I think it's, it's important to mention it again. If you push things through in a democratic society, it is just not gonna work. So thank you.
Okay, thank you so much. I think I will, uh, well, I will simply pass the, we, we should simply pass the microphone to, uh, uh, to uh, Thomas and uh, we, we came back. Uh, I think we already have a lot. I think we, we want to know more uh, from your experiences and you have, a, I, I think maybe later, uh, Rodrigo can speak even further about what exactly, what factor uh, shaped or influence the social acceptance. Yeah, maybe we can come back to have more discussion about your case. And uh, yeah, so uh, we, we talk about, when we talk about citizen participation, we talk about how to uh, mapping our stakeholders and what tools or what format and what democratic process we should go through. But also, we also talk about like uh, how to build in uh, uh, empower, empowerment, empower uh, our uh, participant and also build how to build a trust and also how to uh, see uh, the mindset of the participant or the general pu public and how to facilitate the, the discussion. I think, uh, I think this, this is the reason now we have uh, Thomas here. So I, I, let's uh, invite Thomas to, uh, Thomas give us uh, his talk, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the bridging uh, to me. It's so interesting that you introduced me as a psychologist <laughs> because um, I have to admit, I'm not a psychologist yet because I haven't submitted my thesis yet. <laughs> but um, so technically I'm still a physicist and I feel around this issue of trust, I would like to share a few reflections why the heck I transitioned from being a physicist, being concerned about CO2 utilization and all sorts of technical issues to studying psychology <laughs> and actually also a psychotherapeutic program. Um, because for me, it's basically the learnings of being part of these processes that often fail because of a lack of trust and because of relationships that are not fit for the content that actually wants to be discussed, so to say. So um, I'll try to summarize that in a few minutes, but honestly, it's meant to be an opening into the conversation and not so much a comprehensive summary of everything that might want to be shared at this point. Um, so you have to imagine that I, I joined our institute 11 years ago as a physicist and I made essentially the experience um, that several mentioned throughout the last two days. There is a wide acknowledgement that the challenges we are facing are super complex and every perspective by itself is overwhelmed. So we need to get other perspectives on board. But what I saw happening was Yes, you get people from different perspectives into one room. But then you put all the perspectives side by side. And first, maybe someone from an NGO gives a speech, then an academic gives a speech on the same topic, and then another one gives a, to a speech on the topic. And then you have inspiring coffee breaks in between <laughs> where good conversations take place. But I must admit I was suffering because the many different perspectives couldn't really connect. And I was wondering, why is that? And I decided it doesn't need more knowledge, but it needs what Ortwin described yesterday as process knowledge, so to say, to, to develop a, a procedural architecture, how to integrate these different perspectives. And to, to jump a little bit to what it brought me to was, I noticed people don't build relationships through content. Yeah? If you bring people into one room and they want to discuss about direct air capture, you start with how different we are, because you have your position and an NGO activist has his position and someone from the government has her position, you immediately get confrontation and conflict. But in order to be, to be able to deal with conflict constructively, my observation was it needs a certain relationship quality first, before you can even think, begin to think about content. So that's challenging because in our sustainability-related world, everything is super urgent, right? We don't have time. <laughs> yeah, we need to come to a conclusion immediately. <laughs> but what, what that meant was if you invite people to speak, everybody speaks, this is the problem, this is what I understand, this is what I need to do. 
Next one speaks, this is how I see the problem, this is how, what I understand, and this is what we need to do. But, but it's, it's kind of, it, it's not first everyone speaking about what's the problem, then everyone speaking about what do we understand, and lastly, about what to do. So, so that was a kind of a procedural aspect. So how can I bring people into a communication that starts with, hey, who are you? Yeah, can I look into your eye? Like, are you a human being like me? Where are you from? Like, just to build relationship. And when we are meeting in our institute, um, just among German academics, that might be easy to build relationship. But the first time I was part of a workshop, I was super overwhelmed with it, but that's how I learned, so to say. I remember it was about transformation in the Arctic. There was, uh, there was a representative of the indigenous community from the Arctic. There was someone from the Arctic Council someone from the Foreign Affairs Ministry of the US, someone from Shell, some meteorologists from Europe. You can imagine what you bring into one room if you have these different perspectives. There was no chance that people can talk about the Arctic first. There's a lot, and I think, Bernardi, you emphasized that in your impulse. There's so much experience of mutual transgressions or even violent histories that where you feel, how shall I speak with you about Arctic or about carbon credits when actually I'm still suffering from, uh, from the trauma that my people have experienced due, over the last couple hundred years? Yeah? That is in the room, I felt, if we want it or not. So, first thing I decided, like, I don't start with content. I basically spent the first 30% of whatever time we have just on relationship building. Why are you here? And why are you here, not in terms of what's your interest, but your motivation as a human being? How are you concerned with my invitation, so to say? That takes a lot of time, but I feel that's well-invested time, because as soon as human beings can really connect, they can also grapple with conflict without fighting. You know, it's, it can be friction. They can ask, I don't understand what you mean. They can admit, I don't know. But they cannot do that if there is not a good relationship culture. So I have two more minutes, so I have to focus uh, so many interesting things. Um, <clears throat> I decided to move into psychology and actually also engaging a lot with religious and spiritual perspectives because I found it interesting that sustainability is often discussed at a very technical level, but in the end it's about human beings caring about the well-being of their children, the well-being of the non-human life around them. About, yeah, it's, it's about an emotion that, that connects people. And I felt it is not, um, it, it is very helpful for the relationship building if we are able to invite also that emotional dimension into um, the facilitation, uh, facilitated spaces. But <laughs> because of all the histories that we have with each other, I mean, at the climate negotiations, I was, I think I shared that yesterday over dinner, I facilitated a conversation with indigenous leaders from the Amazon um, region, and I was the only white man in that session. And I felt, I could feel how much cultural heritage I embody in that moment. So it's in terms of shame and guilt and capitalist responsibility and what have you not. So. <laughs> No, it's, it's a lot. It was very obvious. So as a physicist, I had totally no capacities how to hold spaces where humans can have conversations about this dimension of a problem. Um, so, so I felt one thing is to have it, good formats that allow people to build relationships and to have meaningful conversations bit by bit and not everything at the same time. But the other thing is to be able to, to invite the, also the suffering that comes along with the current poly crisis that we have. And maybe that, I even discovered that that is a way how humans can build bridges because they are, we are in this boat together at the moment. But it's so challenging to move from this like, it's your fault or it's your fault, but it's of course not my fault. Yeah, I'm doing the best and I'm the savior here. Yeah, to move to this, we are in a difficult situation how can we hold it together and become active without believing that we have to save the world, 
but taking the responsibility seriously that I can take, not more, but also not less. Um, so that's why I thought uh, I need to understand the different emotions and also be able to hold these spaces. I'm not a therapist and I don't need to become a therapist, but I would say I need to become sensitive to enough to understand the emotions of someone from Western Europe in a certain context will be different to someone from Eastern Europe, will be different from, to someone from Southern Africa. And um, I think that's where I'd like to end because for me that is the, that's what I also said earlier, the, the huge potential that I see in gatherings like these, the, the responses that we find in our different contexts cannot be applied in another context. But the more I feel I'm sensitive to how different people in other parts of the world are perceiving a similar situation, the more I might be able to share what I can offer. And cultivating this sensitivity, to me, is the, the crucial resource uh, in the current transformation. And now I have to add one more thing, because otherwise I m lose the point why you invited me. <coughs> Citizen participation is the topic of our of our panel. And the one thing that I feel comes with all of this is a, an honest humility, I would say. In, in all participation processes that I've experienced, it is so challenging to move from, I need these people, but I don't tell them that I need them, to an honest, I don't know how to solve this. I need your support, yeah? Still, maybe I'm in a leadership position and yes, we are kind of organizing this process, but I can't do it without you. This, this honest humility to say, I cannot do it alone. That to me is the key entry point to any participation process, to any perspective that we invite. And also that needs a space where that can be said, where you don't lose your face when you say, I can't do it alone and all these things. So I have touched various points without concluding everything. But I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense why I'm so passionate about par participation, both from a physics perspective and from a psychological angle, because in the end, I still feel I'm a physicist. I understand self-organization. Now it's not molecules, now it's humans. I'm curious how far that will help us to maneuver through this transformation. Thanks for inviting me here. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, I think we good. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to all the uh, panelists. Uh, I think you probably already have a lot of questions uh, want to raise. Um, has, uh, shall we collect a question now? Uh, if anyone like to raise your question. Hi, um, so thank you all for uh, the great talk. I, I have something to resonate than uh, question, but, um, and I haven't really, think. Uh, I just write it down here, but, um, so I think um, repairment of uh, social and individual wellness or, or trauma uh, in, in this uh, constantly changing context of climate change is something that uh, I personally feel, um, you know, anxious sometimes, and also I think I believe that uh, people from, you know, younger generation would be experiencing uh, more uh, as we go along, and and so that is one thing that I um, I'm curious about. You know, if you have anything to respond to that, um, these kind of. Uh, so, and some people really uh, experience uh, climate-related trauma, trauma, and and that's uh, something that uh, I, I think we might be seeing more uh, related fields or discussion as we go. The other thing is that um, since Professor Du uh, Du Du Lao uh, mentioned um, uh, nuclear and um, you know the the time scale of nuclear and uh, the spatial uh, you know final storage of nuclear and this makes me think about a Carl Jung uh, prototype of um, uh, of uh, psychoanalysts that these are the big monsters that we have in our society and and we have been uh, you know sometimes. It, it, um, most of the time we are capable of controlling that monster 
in that in, in our society, but sometimes it got out of the bag or, or the box. And, and, and that is something that, um, um, you know, maybe this is not a question, but a, a reflection that uh, are we, like how long we are capable of holding that in, uh, in the box or, 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 or maybe that one day our human knowledge has been changing and, and or, or the language or the uh, or knowledge change and and we might not be able to hold it and and I think that is something that we we seldom bring up and and that's the two reflection I have maybe this is not so much related to citizen participation but that's something I I have in mind. Thank you for your feedback and Wenin, would you? Would you like to respond? Okay, just uh, the probably the, the general comments um, regarding you know the nuclear waste you just mentioned. Uh, we did. Um, I, I remember you know like some panels or or uh, you know like the, the meetings that we really focus on the young people because those people who were not uh, really kind of, uh, who have not really experienced the kind of anti-nuclear movement and um, and you know didn't know much about the nuclear West until the issue was brought uh, you know like in front of them so um, the the um, so, so the, 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 the skill that we use is more like a kind of a scenario workshop, uh, you know, like um, help the, the young people to think about the different life stage, how they face, uh, you know, the, the different kind of nuclear uh, the waste issues. You know, for example, you know, when they were, uh, when, when they are born, you know, it, it's just the, the nuclear power plant just like start, uh, start uh, operation and uh, you know when they die until okay uh, maybe you know like a 70s or uh, in their 70s or 80s they are still trying to figure out the how to deal with the nuclear waste issues so it's kind of the lifetime that the issue they need to you know face so it's one thing is that um, you know how to connect the issue with the people who are not familiar um, you know the issue and it's an important issue it's not uh, sometimes we thought it's not um, fair you know to only um, to only uh, I mean target the impact community to think about the issue because we were all benefited from uh, the you know the, the power generation from the nuclear power plants and how come you know the only the few community people need to think about the solution of the nuclear waste so so you know like uh, talking about i don't know if that's uh, the reflection to the public participation but uh, for different uh, you know target audience that uh, we think about how to connect the issue the public issues with their life experience. So, you know, sometimes it's like kind of on the, you know, the big map, we will lead the, the, the people to, um, to think about uh, where they, um, they have a life experience and uh, how do they think about the community. And if the, the nuclear West, uh, you know, if, 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 if it's become a kind of a choosing site for the nuclear West, how will they, you know, ask uh, you know, like uh, some criteria, you know, or, uh, you know, or, or certain, uh, certain kind of regulatory control uh, to protect the site. So the all, all kinds of techniques I we will share. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, Thomas would like to. Um, maybe just a few thoughts on the topic of anxiety. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, and I would like to add, it's, in my experience, it's, anxiety but also anger another very related emotion that comes up a lot in this um, I think it has a lot to do with participation because often the, the participation is not functional because you're too busy with just coping with the anger and the anxiety that people throw into the process yeah that's why I say it's important and at the same time I would like to distinguish what can such a process contain and what is a point where you say, we still want to be responsible, so to say, responsible. Yeah, it's, um, th that's the big challenge. You don't want such a process to be absorbed by all that emotional layer. And that's a point where I feel 
a lot of what I experience as an expression of that collective anxiety, I struggle to, to deal with it when I feel there needs also to be the willingness to engage constructively with it in professionally hosted spaces, sure, but otherwise it just becomes kind of finger pointing and complaining and then I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the drama triangle. It's a, it's a powerful psychological concept where you basically dis distinguish between the victim, the perpetrator, and the savior. And easily you can be drawn into that kind of uh, role, role game, and that's super dysfunctional. So I would say it's important to invite it, but also make clear what are the boundaries because we still want to address a specific challenge. Um, and I wanted to say this anxiety is also shared by the decision makers, from my experience. It is much more challenging for them to expose that, but I'm, I'm more and more in touch with spaces where also it's important for them to not hold that all by themselves and all alone, but with, oh yeah, that's something that is influencing the way how I take my responsibility in society. So, um, and last thing, I hope we don't need to control the monster. I don't, I don't know, I don't wanna be afraid of the monster. We want to contain it, sure, but in my understanding of change, control will not bring us further in coping with that animal, however monstrous it may seem. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks for your response. I think this also um, made me think about, uh, we, we, often we, we talk about how to involve vulnerable group or uh, uh, stakeholders, especially for those community or the very marginal group, how to involve them to participate. But uh, I think it's also really important to involve the powerful, even the very powerful people to, to like your, your uh, Nuclear West Theater should invite all the both from those big companies <laughs> to, to play the role to see if they are community residents, <laughs> how would they deal with Nuclear West? <laughs> I think that would be interesting to see uh, how they, I think the, the entity or, um, should, should bring to the powerful as well. They, they should share the, the they, they, they should take, they should more aware about the climate crisis or all the uh, environmental consequences we have uh, now today. Okay, I think I, we should move to uh, next two questions. Uh, we, we got two uh, questions online. The first one is how can we ensure participation as effective citizen control as opposite to tokenist stick? Uh, whitewash, whitewashing that simply legitimates and uh, reinforce existing hierarchy. I think, okay. <laughs> I, I was also really interested in that question because I saw it and, and, and it says how to ensure participation as effective citizen control. Uh, and for me, uh, I think citizen participation is not about controlling people. Uh, I, I think they, we, we would be in a mistake thinking that um, we, we were asking people like, hey, how can we control you better? That's exactly the, the opposite that, of what we want to do. We want to, um, we have leaders and, and we have citizens and the job of the government is to be leaders, to propose better solutions and the job of the citizens is, is to be citizens, but it doesn't mean that uh, being a citizen means uh, blind obedience and, and, and just uh, be a slave of the decisions of others. When we talk about participation, we talk about a knowledge exchange. So how can the leaders and the society create better solutions by exchanging information? Because for the uh, people on top making the big decisions, proposing um, the projects might be that they're not able to see um, certain stuff that the citizens are able. And it's not because they maybe they don't want to see it, it's because Really, they're not on, on, the, on, the, on the play level, on the, on the ground. And that's what, what, what we want to integrate. But please uh, don't see citizen participation as a, as a method of control. Uh, you, uh, see it exactly as, as the opposite, as a method of creating uh, more inclusive uh, societies. Yeah, I'm fully with you on that. 
And at the same time, I also acknowledge that, like, of course, there are stakeholders that see participation as a way to exert control. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to be naive enough to say that. That may, that may not be what we want, but it's part of reality. So my sense is the trust that we spoke about among the participants is also a quality to the host or the leader or whoever, whichever organization invites into the participation. So I would like to point back to what Ordwin shared yesterday. Be very conscious and clear about what you promise and what you cannot promise. Yeah? Um, nothing is worse, like you said, like to invite people into here, yeah, please participate. But the actual leadership is, doesn't feel committed to the outcome of the process. Yeah? So the involvement of the leadership is super important and the leader cannot say, you do a participation process for me. No, in my experience, it's crucial that the leader is present at least in the very beginning and say, this is my call, this is my invitation, this is what I can promise, but these are the boundaries that I feel committed to. And that's often difficult to identify also for the, those who invite. It's super challenging to know which limits you're operating in. The clearer you can make that call, the more people feel, okay, I don't have to change the whole government, yeah, but this is where I can make my contribution. And that, I would say, addresses this issue. I, I think, yeah, I, I, I'm not so sure if it's the wrong, simply typing wrong <laughs> uh, control. I, I think we will all agree when we talk about uh, citizen participation or, or adopt a deliberative democracy. We won't talk about, we, we, we would uh, hope, we hope not to uh, uh, use the, this kind of perspective to to look at this kind of process is really not uh, about control. And, and secondly, I think uh, we all actually, free, we quite often we, we think uh, if we participate in this kind of uh, so-called citizen uh, engagement forum, uh, will we simply help government to legitimize their policy? So I think this is always a doubt raised uh, in, in, has been raised uh, in like kinds of uh, uh, venue and even for some uh, environmental NGOs, they, 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 they concern this kind of issue. So uh, maybe uh, we can uh, have more discussion back to this issue later. Or you, would you like to respond about this part? Or this kind of forum uh, in the end is simply uh, uh, play as a role to, to, to legitimate uh, the, the, the policy governments want. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll, get, um, I'll, I'll touch upon the first question and, and then maybe later on the second as well. Um, so, one thing I, that comes to mind is how you translate what you want to communicate uh, with a potential participants that you invite to uh, meetings or, or events. And for me, as a policy think tank, um, translating policy languages to common languages that ordinary people or specific groups can understand uh, is the only way that you can make communication effective. And I do notice in some meetings, people have difficulties understanding uh, the, the materials, the information, and they just nod with a friendly smile. But you know, um, nothing is really entering their mind uh, but then sometimes you also see people help each other at the moment and because uh, that, that person is not giving any opinions, not saying anything. And other people noticed and they come in to do a mini translation um, to, to help to bridge that gap. Um, so in order not to have uh, people uh, nodding their head with a friendly smile but not being able to give a uh, 
you know, feedback into the process, uh, I also realized, you know, afterwards that, you know, maybe some of the translations or trainings beforehand could also help with that process. Thank you. Um, I, I think I, I would like to, uh, you know, like kind of raise, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's the different kinds of participation. One is kind of more legal binding that we have, a, you know, like a public hearing or, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the citizen participation in the environmental impact assessment meetings or, uh, you know, like, um, you know, some uh, participation required uh, for, you know, like uh, before the referendum. So the, those are kind of legal binding uh, public, public participation process. and. Um, and during that kind of process that, you know, there's a, there are, are a lot of, I, I think, you know, sometimes tensions, you know, among the citizens because they, everyone want to have a say. And in that kind of process that, uh, you know, uh, it, it's probably not um, kind of very ideal, uh, the, the participation that we discuss here, because, you know, everyone will have a three minutes, for example, you know, talking about, um, What's the problem? My statement, and uh, you know, I, just you know, just what Thomas uh, you know brought about. It's probably not a very uh, present, uh, you know, the discussion. It's not probably not uh, the the place for the brainstorming. But uh, I think it's still important because of um, the due process. You know that. Uh, people will be concerned about. Uh, will bring the issue into uh, the the decision-making process. But we still need, uh, you know, like more uh, particip um, participation uh, experience, or it, it, I think it's also the, the kind of the learning process for people to, um, to um, make a statement of their own interest and also, you know, bring their own experience and to be a constructive part uh, you know, in, in solving the problem. Sometimes I don't like uh, the, the thing is that, you know, okay, we are here uh, to participate just because the, the requirement of public participation. But we are here as a, you know, like, um, uh, you know, to make a contribution, you know, to solve the problem together. So how to manage that kind of atmosphere you know, to make a constructive engagement uh, for everyone. I think that's, uh, that's important. Mm -hmm. so, it, so it's an issue of mindset, it's a kind of, yeah. <laughs> you know, it brings in an interesting aspect um, that I thought of also yesterday during Daniela's presentation. At some point she included empowerment. Um, Participation sometimes sounds as if it's a one way, only one direction. Like somebody has a problem and then I invite someone to participate and it's contributing to me and that's it. And then you leave. In my understanding, that's not the most effective way of catalyzing change. Um, yes, it's true. Like as I right, like to read in this part, the third question, like how do citizen participation activities contribute to policy practice or problem solving? beyond your own research and business tasks. I would say that is super dependent on the question, how concretely can you identify the problem of the one who invites? Yeah? If he or she has a very specific thing, and say, this is what can be addressed, yeah? then I would say it makes sense to invite others. If it's just, let's have a forum on some topic, yeah? it, to me, that's, um, that's kind of the pathway into wasting the resources. But it is equally important to address the ability of everyone who participates. How can you do something in your own context? People choose to come to this participation process because they feel invested in the problem. And maybe for the one who invites, it's about designing a certain law, etc. But in the end, that is not the la layer or the dimension of efficacy of the, participant, of the participants, so to say. But each of them has their own sphere of influence wherever they are. So for me, co-creation is empowering when it is helping the one who invites into the participation, but also includes a phase of retranslating it into the sphere of influence of everyone who is there. 
and that maybe the mother of a child who says like, oh, I can do this and that, and here I have few people to talk about what to do, it can be somebody who's a department leader in a company. Yeah? People are invested into that topic, and they are not only there to deliver something to the person who invited, but also draw conclusions for themselves. And I think if, if the one who invites is serious about the problem, he invests the time and the resources to kind of give that back to the people who, who have participated. Okay, I, I think uh, Thomas in reminds us it's really important, no matter no you are a research project leader or you are a policy maker, you create this kind of uh, uh, citizen participation forum, then you should also consider the interests or the demands of, from, of the participa participation. But uh, still, I, maybe we can jump to the third question and see if any other uh, panelists like to respond. And uh, about this third one, and then I will go back to. Uh, no, no third one. Then we will go back to the second one. Yeah, um, I think maybe I can. How to I can add. sorry? How to invite community to participate in citizen engagement with without the rest of the public mistaking these this is communities for uh, complicity with uh, with policymakers. Yeah. Um, so I think. Um, Citizen participation is not uh, complicity. Again, as, as, I, as I said in, in, in my first comment, it's, it's, not about, it's not about controlling, it's about engagement and exchange uh, of information. Um, in my experience, I never seen uh, other communities see, seeing participation as a way of compliance. I think it's exactly the opposite. Citizens are very happy to have this opportunity to express uh, their opinions, be heard, and also uh, uh, hear uh, other, other groups. Usually, um, there's a certain level of frustration where citizens are, don't, don't find a way to express um, their opinions. And in this type of participations, this, this type of processing of citizen participation, they get the opportunity sometimes for the first time to, uh, to say what they think and what they would be believe and what they would want. So um, I think we should see it like this and, and not as a way of, of compliance with, with policymakers. Um, I want to share an example of a past meeting that we had before. So one of the projects I worked on was to develop a process that incorporates um, ecological data and um, environmental data and uh, social uh, conditions in different local um, in farming villages. Um, in order to do some kind of preliminary assessment to decide if um, installation of solar panels on top of fish farms would impact the environment um, and local communities and, uh, and how, how, how heavy would that kind of impact be. And I thought that was a quite neutral process uh, but it means different things to local communities. So uh, we were about to hold this meeting in uh, one town in uh, southern Taiwan. And we were looking at different meeting uh, locations. But then we heard from uh, one of the friends we were working with and telling us that, no, 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 you cannot go to that place because people will really resist that. And then we finally realized that uh, that building was built by a certain interest group. And if you have meeting in that building, that would mean you are with that group. So not having that knowledge before designing the meeting would be dangerous because we do not want to uh, put the meeting with that color or, or, or preventing 
people from going to that meeting because they don't want to be identified with that group. So uh, then we realized it was so important to have the local knowledge because everything has a meaning. Every location, um, the font you use, the, the, the place you order lunch boxes, um, and the amount of lunch boxes you order. Um, people are nodding heads, yes. Um, uh, all have meetings, all have meanings. So really doing enough homework, getting to know the local conditions, what local people care about, what are the taboos. Uh, these uh, were, were some of the lessons learned uh, through, through the projects that, that we've been working with. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think I probably will just add one point. Um, the experience that we have, uh, I would say um, the citizen participation um, kind of driving the, the kind of a new response from the, 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 the government because, you know, with the new citizen inquiries, the government uh, need to do, you know, some kind of cross-sector talk, uh, you know, the, the communication that they never, um, um, I mean, need to, you know, before, because that's uh, the, the citizen participation may, uh, you know, like um, raise the, the kind of a new questions or new task for the government. Okay, let me um, give a kind, maybe a concrete example that, um, you know, for the, uh, as I say, the nuclear sighting, uh, a nuclear waste sighting issue, um, before, um, you know, like, uh, the Thai power company already did it uh, for, you know, like for decades. So, you know, when we uh, first, uh, you know, tried uh, to do um, the kind of, um, kind of, uh, you know, that do, doing the kind of new method and to involve the citizen partic participation, they said we already did it, uh, you know, like uh, several years. It never worked. And we don't, uh, and we are still doing it. And uh, I don't think, you know, like any new, you know, that new, new one coming to this, uh, it's already very controversial issue will solve the problem. So I think it's not uh, about, you know, like solving the problem immediately, but build up uh, the kind of the, the understanding you know, or, you know, like to understand, you know, why we came here uh, without, uh, we, uh, without really, uh, you know, taking care of, uh, you know, like uh, the different concerns among the communities. Because they, they what they did is, okay, we uh, built up the relationship. They built up the relationship um, by, you know, like kind of, uh, you know, like, um, um, <laughs> Okay, it is by, you know, like um, kind of, uh, you know, give um, like eating with, um, by, um, I'm, I'm trying to find a, 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 the right words, but um, by, uh, you know, like a, a talking to the community, by buying the things from the, the community or, you, you, because I don't want to use the, the words bribing, so, so I'm trying to find the, the, the good words on it. Okay, so, so, uh, so when we uh, first come uh, to the, the community, it's just like what Thomas, uh, you know, talked, you know, to build up the relationship with people. So even though that we have the formal um, kind of participa uh, participation process, you know, like uh, to invite the people in, into the meeting, but before the meeting, we interview people, we talk to people, and to know, you know, where the, the, uh, these people are from, where their interests are, and, uh, you know, like, um, uh, and what they can contribute. Yeah. So we can organize them in a constructive way, yeah. you know, to talk, uh, you know, to talk to each other. Yeah. So I think that's, uh, you know, important to, you know, making that kind of, I, I would say, organic public participation work. So, um, so I think that, uh, you know, that really, you know, what um, the, the public participation, um, you know, make a contribution also to the new, uh, the governance idea.
you know, to make the, to drive the, the, the government uh, need to, you know, like kind of cross the border and to talk, uh, to, to talk to the sectors they never, you know, thought about. I'm fully with you, yeah. I, I had that on my list of things that I wanted to share and I didn't get it. It's, it's so crucial from my perspective when you invite people to participate, you build a relationship with them. It, it's not just, okay, you tick the following boxes and that's why you're here, but you have to Im anticipate, like, can these people work together well with each other? Is it okay to select people randomly or do I need to hand select people to make sure, oh, there might be this tension, there might be that, and, but they can build this and that bridge. It, it's super helpful just to ensure that the working atmosphere stays constructive. It's not about avoiding the conflict and kind of like just picking people who like each other, but it's about people who can hold that working atmosphere with each other. Yeah, so add to that, you know, before, you know, when uh, the government think about the public participation, it's quite simple, you know, just like set up the meeting time and, uh, you know, set up the location and invite the people and they thought that they will come over. If they don't come over, okay, you are not care about, you know, the local issue. But sometimes, you know, people need a motivation or you need to give, uh, uh, I, I think I, I like uh, what uh, Professor uh, Ren uh, talk about the agency. Yeah. of the people, you know, because uh, you, you want to invite them to make, uh, you know, the, the contribution. Mm -hmm. It's not like, okay, we set up a meeting, we set up the, the agenda, and you come over, and, uh, you know, it's a, you, it, we just go over the process. And, and now you need to think about, you know, why people want to invest their time exactly. in the discussion and, um, you know, what kind of result uh, they want. So, uh, you know, during the, uh, for the public participation, I think my, my team or, you know, our, our, my colleagues that invest a lot of time to build up the relationship, to, to, do, to do the field work. Yeah. So in that case that you can really, you know, like bring the people, yeah. you know, like willing to, you know, like talk to each other. And you know, okay, thank you. I think <laughs> now it gets okay, interesting. Very interactive <laughs> talk. Huh? Uh, uh, well, I think we, um, I think this is a very important principle, very, uh, a vital principle. Uh, if we we can simply say saying, uh, okay, we, we ch I choose this tool uh, or I want this for format to conduct a uh, 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 participation, citizen participate forum. We actually have to have a lot preparing work, work, including staff from field work and get local knowledge, build up social relationship with local people. So I think this is quite important uh, experiences to share with our audience. Um, so, but, but uh, since time is limited, I think I will invite uh, more audience to join us. Uh, Professor Zhou Guitian from National Taiwan University. Okay, thank you. I, I would like, not, I would not, I would not swore in the detailed discussion how to yeah, conduct the citizen participation. But I think the public participation is actually important. But how can we actually design that in the whole this government's framework? I will take two events. One event is the, the, the Taiwan version of the uh, Yellow Vest movement. Another version is about the government's version. First of all, we, I, we, I totally agree to just uh, as Obin yesterday yeah, mentioned, so by the actually public participation, we can elicit the concern of the main stakeholder. And uh, secondly, we can actually use some assessment tool such as the citizen climate assemble, citizen yeah, uh, uh, conference, citizen forum, round table, focus group. I think uh, lots of the instruments uh, we can use. This is uh, how, we, how do we actually urge our deputy minister, okay, our government, uh, to embark more social science in the net zero process. Because social science can help a lot of the things to help the society, the government to explore the stakeholder, the statement, the standard. And uh, Obin also uh, stressed that we can conduct a me method and the procedure to co-generate the 
narrative of net zero. I think this is a more, very important thing. So, uh, in my uh, in my view, as I totally agree that. But I, as Shoujian shows the energy transition white paper, I will tell you the story. Once I uh, joined the uh, uh, a meeting in the uh, executive yuan, they drafted the uh, uh, guideline of the energy energy development. And uh, in this draft, they have the only three pillars. The first pillar is energy security. Second pillar is environmental protection. The third pillar is green industry. I said that is unstable, only three pillars. So I suggest uh, two plus one pillar called uh, social equality, including social communication or risk communication. So after that, so the executive uh, released this uh, guideline of the energy development. Then you uh, start to uh, launch the, the, the meeting of the uh, energy uh, transition white paper. But we know the energy transition, transition uh, uh, white paper draft is, really, is actually finished in the end of the 2018. But our premier ratified this uh, white paper is until November 2020. In my article, I said that is the uh, delayness of the risk governments, of the net zero governments in Taiwan. This is, okay. The other yeah, events is that uh, uh, in 2018, actually what, what I said, that what's important is how can we actually explore the, 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 the real yeah, stakeholder. In 2018, our EPA wants to actually strengthen the, the environmental you know, regulation yeah, to the, to the, uh, for the air pollution. So actually the government has invited, invited some leader of the uh, car, uh, truck, uh, truck, truck association, yeah, some truck association leader or some rep representative join that, but they ignore the single driver of the diesel truck, you know, to the end. Uh, Two or three thousand, uh, two or three hundred truck driver, you know, they broke the street around the uh, uh, presidential hall. At that time, the DPP, the ruling party, lost uh, landslide uh, yeah, the, in the local election. I, I would like to say how actually we can match, and this, that would be a match condition. The government want to subsidize the uh, the, 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 the driver, yeah, right, the diesel driver, but this is not enough. The, you know, the amount for, or the, or the quota for that driver is not enough. At that time, they don't have the, the accessibility they, in which they can sell their so-called second-hand uh, truck to other foreign country or foreign market. And so this is also, now they have the opportunity, their accessibility. You can say, okay, they, they, they widespread the pollution to other countries, but that is another thing. But at least they had this market condition. They can yeah, match these things. So I, I would like to say the total risk government's framework, including citizen participation, including stakeholder environment, we, we should have the total vision. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Zhou. Uh, I think Professor Colin. Am I right? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank okay, you. Okay. Welcome. Uh, I would like to make uh, uh, some short comments, and they reflect a little bit my own experiences, observations, and some research. I work in Canada uh, to say that uh, in advance, and because I will relate to that in a moment. But what I'm targeting to is two uh, arguments that I want to make in my comments. Is one is that we should clearly differentiate between what we call transdisciplinary research, in which we addressees of the research involved in an early research process. And this process often also includes something like participation or, or targeting to, towards public participation. And on the other side, of course, something um, when we use citizen participation or stakeholder participation as a democratic element in uh, policy or political decision making. 
So I work in Canada and we have a, a, a series of transdisciplinary research projects in which we try to involve, of course, also our indigenous community. And, and that is a real hard thing to, come, to build up the trust in, in advance or to build up relations to them. And for example, uh, if I would like to do that as an old white man with gray hair, it's impossible. So um, I try to do that. So they expect, for example, the indigenous community that I live with them at least six to nine months to try to get into that culture and that heritage, which is so important uh, to understand before you can even make connections to that and try to build up trust to them. So what we did as university, for example, is we hire a lot of new professors who come out of that, uni of that communities because they are, let me say in that way, more or less a natural link, a natural liaison person because they already have built up the trust of these indigenous communities. And you, when they work together in an indigenous project with me, then it's possible. Not that I directly have the contact to them, but via this liaison person, this professor who comes out of the indigenous community. So, and of course, this is typical research and the challenges with research. Another challenge would be that to invite them to a democratic mechanism of citizen participation, which is another challenge. So that would be the same. If I would do that, it would not work in that way. So I have to use my colleague who comes out that who has this relation because we have to be honest with each other often these processes have to be very pragmatic we are, have time limits we have funding limits and that is not possible so but on the other side i have to mention when we because i had a chance in my early career with artwin to moderate uh, citizen juries and such things so if we not give the space where people can express their very uh, often vague expressed uh, uh, what you call tra trauma and uh, this kind of things, then it's very difficult. And that not, has not only to be to do with indigenous people, but for them it's much more important to do that. So give them time and space, but be pragmatic and try to moderate and target to the goal. And as you said, I can only emphasize what has been said yesterday. I wasn't here, but I heard it right now. So that it's really important that the, the, the participants are taken seriously. Another experience, what I observed when I analyzed the Great Lakes, they have a very, very sophisticated participation system from experts over stakeholders to public participation. And this, uh, I want now to make this argument that citizen participation is not one recipe. It's, uh, it's, there is not one form, there is no, not one mode that is the best approach to it. And uh, what I uh, find out is that we need to combine and aggregate different forms of public participation to have a very successful and trustworthy political decision-making process. And one element, just to make it short, was there are, I observed a, a public hearing with 600, 700 people in one room over three hours. And the typical North American public hearing is you uh, write down your name in a list and then you have a chance to speak two minutes. And what was good and that I realized a little bit later or during that public hearing was in front where the uh, US Secretary of Environment and the Canadian Minister for Environment. This was the important thing because during the public hearing suddenly an indigenous woman stood up and talked about her community and how the environmental risks and problems directly affect the health of their children, that they get chronic diseases and even die. And at that moment, there was not something that you could hear anything in the room. Everyone was silent, but for her, what I got, because she almost, not almost, she really cried at the end. There were uh, water in her eyes. For her, it was important to be heard by the ministers. That was an important element, even if there was no further discussions on her issues, yeah? So just to say the aggregation of different forms, I think is very important to organize it depending a lot on funding and time, yeah.
Okay, thank you so much. Okay, I think time is up. So I would, uh, I, I think in the very final, I will invite all our panelists to, to uh, roll up your, maybe your key message to our audience in 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, one minute, and then we will finish this uh, panel. Okay, just very short. I think re in response to uh, Professor Zhou's uh, questions or, you know, like uh, demands that, uh, you know, to include more social scientists uh, in the, the kind of a risk governance. I think it's important as I, I wrote in my uh, slides that, you know, the, the, the social scientist as uh, the policy entrepreneur knowledge broker and a social trust builder. And I think we need to raise the, the participation quality in order to make uh, the, you know, the problem solving possible. So that's my message. My message is to just to add on to one of the questions raised before. So uh, not only being able to translate what you want to communicate, being able to really understand uh, the language that from different groups, different people, uh, what they express, because sometimes it's not necessarily in the form of uh, you know policy languages. Sometimes it could be uh, uh, more on the emotional side, um, and being able to read that. And, and move on. I think it's also an important ability, a, a skill uh, to provide in these processes. Thank you. Uh, my short message, uh, it's mainly also de dedicated to natural scientists, is begin with stakeholder engagement, begin by understanding the needs uh, of the people, and this will um, make your science more relevant. So let the needs of the people guide your research. Ooh, <laughs> 30 seconds now, impossible. Um, but the one thing that I didn't say that kind of wraps it up for me is um, let's dare to be human. I believe if we dare to be authentic as participants of the struggles that we address, then everyone we engage with feels that. We, we, as invitees, as hosts, as whoever, we are part of it. And the more we dare to bring our own humanness into that role, the more I think that shapes the whole process. It might take some courage in some situations, we make ourselves a little vulnerable, but my experience is it pays off in the process. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, I, I would, uh, shall, shall we give the, a big hand to all our panelists. We have a very informative and uh, productive discussion this afternoon. So my key message is sorry for the delay and enjoy your tea time. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. For, for the second panel discussion of this afternoon's uh, agenda, we have a panel discussion on social economic solutions on the pathway to net zero. This session is moderated by Professor Dai Xingzheng. He's a TUSH Steering Committee co-chair and also a professor at National Donghua University. Panelists include Professor Dr. Johan Liliestam from Research Institute of Sustainability Potsdam, uh, joining us from online, and Dr. Roting Huang Lachmann from Climate Service Center Germany, Dr. Xiao Daiji from Academia Sinica, and Professor Liu Jiande from the Civil Service Protection and Training Commission. Please welcome Professor Dai Qingshen. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Xingshen Tai. I'm very honored to, uh, to uh, moderate uh, this panel discussion. And uh, uh, the major topic of this session is social and economic solutions. We all need solutions for uh, net zero uh, goals. Uh, and uh, solutions can be diverse. Solutions can be uh, policies or policy instruments. Produce, uh, sorry, solutions can be or should be narratives, 
just like uh, uh, Professor Ren yesterday highlighted, narratives are critical. And the solutions can be, uh, for example, uh, involve governance issues, just like, uh, just like later uh, Professor Xiao uh, will uh, mention. So uh, these are the basic uh, insights. Uh, we, I mean the panelists, the four panelists, uh, we uh, through uh, pre-meeting, uh, pre uh, we through discussion, so we get some uh, conclusions for uh, the basic uh, structure of today's discussion. So uh, we are very uh, pleased to invite four panelists uh, to join the discussion. The first one is Professor uh, Dr. Didi Schnem. Uh, he is the uh, research group leader from the RIPS, and he uh, participated in today's discussion online. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Didi Schnem. And the second uh, panelist is Professor Huang Lachman, yeah, from uh, uh, Garrix. So uh, actually, uh, this morning, uh, Dr. Huang has played a major role of the workshop. Thank you so much. And the third panelist is uh, Professor Dr. Daiji Xiao. Yeah, he is uh, the top environmental economist in Taiwan and uh, has played a major role in designing some of the uh, policy instruments like te uh, carbon tax in Taiwan. So uh, today, uh, Professor Xiao will contribute what, uh, what his experience is in Taiwan. And the fourth panelist is uh, Professor Dr. Lu uh, Jiande. Yeah, Professor Lu is also top uh, sociologist in Taiwan and major uh, in social policy. And he is now uh, also acting, uh, serving as the uh, deputy minister for the Civil Service Protection and Training Commission. So uh, Professor Liu will also bring uh, his insights about social policies. Okay, so now let's begin uh, with the first panelist, uh, Professor Lidishnam, thank you. All right, thank you for this introduction. I assume that you can hear me well. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure you need to say something. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, super, super, super. Good. Then I can then I can start talking. I'm going to um, let's say report a little bit on some of the challenges that arise in the energy transition. Let's say in the second phase of the energy transition, um, reporting some evidence from from the European and from the German context of the types of things that, that can emerge, how difficult it is to get policy instrumentation right when it's not only about introducing technologies. Uh, on a relatively small scale, but really changing the entire system and doing the big leap from a fossil-based energy system to a renewables-based one. So I'm going to say something about that in the next um, seven minutes or so. So in, in Europe, we have set new targets. The European Commission has decided that Europe is to, go, is to be climate neutral by 2050. And the member states of the European Union have started to set their own climate neutrality goals to fit this overarching union-wide target, including uh, the Germans. The Germans have set a very radical target to meet climate neutrality by 2045, so a little bit faster than, than the European Union as a whole, with intermediate targets of uh, minus 65% greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and minus 80% by 2050. And we can see here, this is a quite radical departure from, from the past trend. The past trend is good, it's downward, but it's still what is needed of us, what is <laughs> to meet these new targets, these upcoming targets is something quite different. And that applies to the energy and to the electricity sector as well. For the 2030 um, timeframe, for example, we have an 80% target for renewables in the electricity sector. And that's interesting because in, well, you could say that the electricity sector is the one sector where the transition is going well. We have uh, in the German context increased the share of renewables from five or six percent 20 years ago, 25 years ago, to 46 percent. So almost half of the electricity in the German power segment is renewable today. So that's a quite 
remarkable success. But at the same time, this took 20 or 25 years to achieve. And now we need to do the same, right? Going from 6 to 46%, and now we need to go from 46 to 80%. But we don't have 25 years, we have seven years. So if we look at this in a, in a graphical way, we see that there's quite much to do. What we see here are the, uh, the deployment trends of the recent past in black, and then for wind on top and for solar power um, at the bottom. And then the, the blue and the yellow charts are the deployment corridors to meet the 2030 and 2040 targets in the renewables. So we see that we're nowhere near meeting these things. We need to have massive increases of both wind power deployment and photovoltaics deployment, a factor of eight for wind and a factor of 10 for, for solar PV from the bottom levels a couple of years. So we see that the deployment is increasing, but of course, we're not seeing anything near what would be possibly needed. So then you might ask, well, what does Germany do to achieve these goals, to, to really eight, eight double or 10 double their, and their deployments? Well, the first thing that has happened is that they have increased the, the auction instrument. They issue tenders for capacity um, to meet, meet these, um, these targets. And that has happened. The, the deployment corridors are now reflected in the, in the tender instrument which is a good thing, but still we're not seeing that the, the deployment is really picking up pace. And one of the big problems here is that they don't really know how to administer the expansion. The administration, in particular at the local level, is not really keeping up pace. I'm going to illustrate that with, with some empirical data that we've gathered um, over the last 10 years. So if we only look at how long time does it take to get a building permit for a wind farm in the 2011, this was 20 months. So from the time that you apply for a building permit to the point that you get it or that it is rejected, of course, was 20 months. In 2021, this had grown to 39 months. And preliminary data 22 suggests that of the wind farms that started construction that year, they had been waiting for 48 months to get only their building permit. And after that, they, of course, need to build. And before that, they need to plan the whole thing. So it's really, really slow. And the question is, why does this happen? Well, we find two big reasons. On the one hand, I mean, <laughs> Germans need to be Germans, right? And what Germans do is they have super complicated bureaucracy. And if you have this super complicated and really ballooning bureaucracy combined with a low and decreasing administrative capacity at the local level, so that the clerks in the town hall are simply not able to handle these things in, within a reasonable time frame, then you get these big delays. You get a kind of a paper jam in your local town. And on the other hand, we also see that there is increasing citizen protests, um, increasing citizen opposition against wind farms. And that includes very long or often very long litigation processes. About one third of wind power projects end up uh, in court. And if that happens, then of course, the, the whole permission time takes even longer than we see. So we see the German experience on this is hardly compatible with anything for the 2030 or 2040 targets. It's, it's, it's not really working well. But at the same time, Germany is top of the class in the international or the European comparison. We see Germany here on the far left with their 40 months or 39 months permission time in 2021. And some countries, Belgium, Greece, Sweden, Croatia, take up to 10 years to get their building permits out. And of course, that's not going to work. That's not going to work with the 2050 targets. So there are new laws coming that were just recently decided that every member state needs to assign so-called go-to areas where uh, the interests of wind power are weighed uh, higher than the interests of natural protection or landscape protection um, or such things. And in these go-to areas, there are simplified permission procedures and the authorities have 12 months time to decide to either approve or reject an application um, outside the go-to areas, they will have 24 months to decide to either approve or reject the proposal. And if the authority fails to decide to make any decision at all, then the project is automatically approved. And the aim of this is, of course, to speed up things and make sure that we are at least theoretically capable or able to meet our mid-term, long-term targets. So this is what's going on. Right? We see these, these, uh, these, these problems with the administration and we see that there is quite strong action going on. And now, of course, it is up to us to observe what happens. Now, does this work at all? And I think the jury is still out on whether accelerating these permission processes in this way is good or bad. So at the moment, we're focusing on speed. Speed is the central problem. 
but we're still ignoring the administrative capacity. So the question still remains whether shortening these deadlines will actually speed up processes. I mean, if we don't stock up administration, there will be no effect. Right? And because there is no money to hire new people and there is also, also no people to hire, there's a big shortage of, of qualified personnel. This means that maybe we need to move staff from other departments in, in, in the town halls and in the authorities so that we just shift this delay in permissions from, from the wind power, which they need to do, but then instead we get problems with something else, with new tram lines or with daycare or with railways or whatever else happens. So the question is, if we don't increase the administration or seriously dejunk the bureaucracy, the question is whether this will work at all. And if it does work, right, there are questions about citizen rights and opposition as well. In particular, if, if it happens that the administration is not able to really handle these things fast enough and the applications are automatically approved without a proper assessment. What will happen? Will this then trigger new opposition that people feel steamrolled, they feel threatened, they feel that they're not really taken seriously because in a way they are not taken seriously if the things are just automatically approved without a proper assessment. And what then happens is that maybe we cause further deployment problems down the road. We shift the problem just with first point, we just shift the problem from one place to another. For example, if you cannot take a wind farm to court and complain about that uh, and stop the project that way, maybe you will instead address the grid connection or some other spatial planning issues. So we just shift the resistance from one place to another without solving. So this talk is really to be, on the one hand, raise some flags and say there are different types of problems coming up in, in the second phase and the later phase of the energy transition. And we need to not only take into account the, the rights of, of, of the climate and of the speed of the energy transition, but also consider what can we do, what is our capacity, and not forget to consider citizen rights and what people actually want in these processes as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lady Stem. And in his talk, uh, he took one example of accelerating permission process in Europe. And from a Taiwanese perspective, this, this looks like quite a little bit uh, strange to Taiwanese because now in Taiwan, we are talking about maybe we have a too loose administration process, so we have to uh, we, we, we should have a more rigorous and, may, and maybe more uh, comprehensive uh, administration process. But surely it's due to uh, two quite different uh, contexts. But anyway, I think uh, uh, this uh, European or uh, German uh, experience can offer some insight uh, for uh, the, the discussion we, here in Taiwan. Okay, now we move to uh, Dr. Huang Lachman. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't have the remote control, but I trust you will change the set when I let you know. So that um, I'm very happy to join this um, panel. And when I got this topic, uh, social economic solution, it's the, the main interest of my research. I immediately know what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the societal narrative for bottom up solutions and its interrelationship with the with the policy making thank you thank you so much so that we already have been listening to this um, many times yesterday so I, I i don't have to give you the definition of the what narrative is or societal narratives are and then if we are going to ask us one key question then this would be the key question i asked myself in this panel is how could we co-develop positive narratives with stakeholders to co-create this kind of bottom-up social economic solutions. And this co-creation of narrative process, I would still use the definition that I often recall from the narrative economics is that to transmit messages through stories and use these stories to influence the behavior or improve anticipation and prepare for actions and structure decision making, governance and policy making. And there are different kind of blocks of this societal narrative. 
then let me go through the plug. So they are like this societal transformation, like the change that you want to see and drive in the society. And this bottom-up solutions, policy making, societal narrative, and this core development process of stakeholder. Um, if we can take a pen right now to draw a interaction of these five blocks, they are very dynamic and it really depends on case to case to see which one is driving which. So it could be we start with the citizen participation and core development process of stakeholder, then you might drive to some bottom up solution or drive to develop some societal narratives and eventually will drive to societal transformation. But it could be the other way around. We can have some kind of policy making that drive some solutions and that drive the dialogue that develop the societal narrative and then and drive the transformation. So it really depends. And then I mentioned this to Professor Tai and the TSH uh, colleagues, and then they gave me extra homework. They said, could you give us some more examples from Germany and Taiwan, from both countries? So I did my homework. So I collect a series of examples worldwide, from Germany, from Taiwan. And then um, me as a climate uh, economic scientists, I really like the example of the ozone layer protection. So when it was identified that, um, that there was uh, that there were holes in the ozone layer that caused uh, the, the, the skin cancer, and the Montreal Protocol was ratified, and then all the countries decide to ban a CFCS. And if you look at this successful story, that it's the dream of all the climate scientists that we wish Kyoto Protocol, we wish Paris Agreement would have had uh, a same path, that it would have been perfect, would have been sitting here. And then, then so, so it, we made it, we made it with the Montreal Protocol and we fixed the ozone layer. And then, so, so it was possible with the, with the treaty. And there are also some other examples. So, so the minimizing the plastic waste, you only need to look at um, in front of your tables, almost every one of you have a thermal can or a water bottle for you know, buying bubble tea, for using it for, for getting the coffee. Are you doing it for three or five Taiwanese dollars? Or you are actually doing it for your intrinsic motivation to do it for the society, to reduce the plastic waste. And so, so, so we made it in the society, in the Taiwanese uh, society. And then also there are right now more and more uh, movement that to, to, um, to basically encourage the plant-based diet even got picked up by a lot of institutions, NGOs, schools, hospitals to have at least one day out of um, a week to have a plant-based diet to reduce the GHG emission and imagine uh, this was not happening before our generation. So the previous generations, they were not linking this plant-based diet to reduce the uh, GHG emissions. So this is a new sort of the narratives that is already in our society. And then I, um, I was talking to Professor Shaw about this rise for pedestrian cyclists. There's already a long history um, in Europe called critical mass. So the cyclists, they gather once per month to go on the street to claim the rights for pedestrian cyclists. And this had a, 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 have been driving some consequences or let's say driving some positive impact in the European society that there are more car-free zones in the urban planning Europe. So if you come to Hamburg, I will show you the car-free zone um, newly developed area after the city government, urban planner, interview the younger generation. How would they picture in the future what kind of new community they want to live? And then the younger generation answer, we don't want to buy cars. We want to ditch our cars. Cars are so expensive to buy and to keep. We want car-free zones. And then that's how they actually um, uh, plan the new area of the, the, the Hamburg. And then I was trying to find examples and I found this local NGO's example that you can see the local NGO, they are linking net zero to the rights of the pedestrian. They can walk safely in the Taiwanese street. And then the last one I would call it is the biggest societal experiment since pandemic is this affordable transport, public transportation. Because during a pandemic time, people start to go back to their cars because they're afraid of the virus. And then the, the, the petrol price rise. And then 
the, the different kind of government were trying to find new ways to subsidize the people because of inflation for different kind of economic incentive. And then Germany had first last year three months of nine euro ticket. You only need to pay nine euro per month and then you can use the public transportation all over Germany, excluding the fast uh, speed rail. It was a success, created a, a bit of chaos because it was really cheap, but since 1st of uh, May, this becoming a constant uh, affordable public transportation, you only need to pay 49 euro per month. You can ride all the public transportation um, in Germany, excluding the high-speed rail train. And in Taiwan, you have the same thing. So uh, right now, you live in Taipei or Kaohsiung or whichever, you can spend a relatively small a lot of money to have this um, uh, public transportation. And you mentioned this is actually, we are the first generation that we have such affordable public transportation. So in Germany right now, we are trying to evaluate whether this induced the, the, the change of the behavior that people really ditch their cars for commuting. And then right now in Germany, we are collecting more of this kind of positive societal narrative concerning the renewable energy. And we, I call it yes in my backyard and on my roof. So we went out to, to interview people um, why they decide after the energy crisis time, why they decide to install, for example, solar PV on their roof. And I can tell you a really nice story. I went on to talk to the, the uh, household and then they, I would call them a blue blue collar worker. So they are not a typical middle class and upper class. But then they came to me really excitedly showing me an app on their phone and say, I can tell you, today I generate so and so many kilowatt hour of energy. And how many of them I use it myself in my household and then the rest that I don't use in my appliances, I can sell it back to the grid. How, look, how much money I earn today. You know, they are talking to me like some kind of stock market price that they can look at it and with some kind of enjoyment. And this is the moment I realized that they are creating different kind of narratives in their society. And they share this experience with the visualized app and information with their neighbors about yes, in my backyard and on my roof. So I hope I give you enough of the encouraged stories. Then I'm going to ask a question. If we already successfully created the, the, these kind of narratives, why can't we make another one for the net zero? We already achieved it in the previous crisis and different. Of course, some of them, they are, let's say, the early movement. But it's possible. We knew it's possible. But while we are learning from these kind of narratives, especially the ones that went viral on social media, there are two things I want you to watch out. The first one is that when we move really, really fast, we wanted to make it really effective, especially from the policy point of view, want to drive societal changes, especially the solutions. We had to make sure we don't create this kind of problem called polarization in society. Uh, last month, I was just in a Herrenhausen conference in Hanover in Germany. It's a conference organized by uh, the, the network I'm in called RISC-CAN, Risk Knowledge Action Network. We invited the, the public health experts, psychologists, economists, and climate scientists together and to ask how we, from climate change perspective, we can learn from COVID because it was one of the huge, uh, biggest systemic risk event that we ever experienced as a whole society. And we reflect on one thing that we did something wrong with the policy. It's that we created a policy during a pandemic time that only people vaccinated can go to certain events. And then those people who are not vaccinated, they are not allowed to go to certain shops, certain areas, even certain public areas. We were dividing the societal society into half and they become one group of privileged people and become another group of, uh, another group of unvaccinated, uneducated, extreme rights, we, whatever we call them on the media or between our society. And what happened? We stopped having dialogue. And then right now we learn back from us, we have to make sure, make sure that we don't create the same policy in the net zero, that we want to make it fast. We start to shame the other side of people and they might, they might not, you know, they, are, they might face a lot of 
uh, they say development issues or some uh, economic issue. So this is the one one part that I would like to remind you. And the second thing is that. Um, we are also collecting the societal narrative. They are not fact-based, they are not science-based. And then, of course, we collect a lot of narratives, sadly, from the right, extreme right-wing parties in Germany, how they convince the people, for example, when the government decide to ban the diesel engine, the combustion engine, then they start to say, yeah, but how about those single moms who cannot keep driving the diesel car to work to earn the money for the family? Remember, their, their narrative always contain one very important is they are always standing with the poor. And we, these renewable energy policy are just creating more measures and incentive for the privilege. So to learn from this, we have to remember if we are having some kind of policy or societal uh, solutions, we have to remember to stand with the poor from the beginning and then to include them in our narratives for these solutions. And I like to, um, I really like to um, uh, use this uh, IPCC working group one. So if you know IPCC a little bit, working group one is a typical physicist, natural scientist, uh, delivering the messages. This is their first figure with human being on top as this uh, communication. And it's most tweeted uh, figure um, they ever published before. And why this is a successful uh, communication? Because you can find yourself in it. No matter which year you are born, they don't just give you the bar of the blue color to the red and purple color. You can see yourself in it, which generation you were, what kind of uh, climate uh, impact you were experiencing. So we need to, while we are serving and giving these kind of science evidence, we have to remember we have to put human back. This is quite important. So this science base and having a societal stakeholder as the essential part of your societal narrative. And then I want to conclude uh, one last story. Um, I was working with different kind of stakeholder engagement for the past few years. And then we, we create some societal narratives in EU project in four cities in EU. And we were doing it uh, in the fifth societal narrative in Kaohsiung city in Taiwan as a knowledge transfer. And the people of city um, in, in Kaohsiung asked uh, how to create a narrative. We don't know what it is. And then um, our EU project partners say, just imagine you are creating a story that you are really, really proud and they will touch your heart and move you and you will be so proud to tell this story and be part of it. And there was a moment I was really touched to be in this position and at the same time working with the local people that at the first time this ever, the citizen can be part of this narrative development. And I want to give you this quote back to you, and hopefully we can co-create this new generational narrative together with the citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Huang Lachman. Uh, actually, I'm very grateful to you uh, because during the pre-meeting discussion, you uh, suggest the uh, idea of bottom-up social narrative. And I have to say, this uh, idea really inspired me and my, uh, our team members. So, uh, and together with uh, Professor Ren's uh, suggestion, we need uh, narratives are important. Yeah, so I, that really uh, inspired all of us here that uh, we should have uh, uh, new uh, narratives for, uh, for net zero uh, targets uh, and, and policies. And also I know that uh, here uh, in our audience, uh, there has been lots of people, you have, uh, you have abundant experiences with uh, social narratives. So later we can have a more uh, in-depth discussion about this topic. Okay, thank you. And then uh, let's invite P Professor Xiao. Please, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'd like to take this uh, 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 seven minutes to talk, just give a very brief uh, uh, cover, coverage of this uh, very big topic, like the policies, instruments, and the governance for net zero. Okay, um, I just, uh, okay, we, we 
in order to meet this target of 2050 net zero, we need not only science, technology, and innovation, that's a must. We, we have to do, we need that. And then other than that, we also need a sound policies. So many sound policy and instruments and the governance models, and that's what I'm go going to cover to, in this uh, short talk. Okay, how to reach uh, 2050 net zero? Two things must be done. One is carbon reduction, the other one is uh, carbon removal. Everybody, we all of us know that. So the science, technology, and the innovation in this field, in these two fields, so carbon reduction and the carbon removal, that's, uh, that's um, uh, we need to invest and, and a lot uh, in, 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 from now on and, and up to in the future. And uh, on the so policy side, then there are these four uh, major uh, areas. One is uh, environmental education, to let people know that just like uh, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Huang's uh, 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 to topic, that's about uh, that kind of a narrative, that's very important. I I'm very happy to hear uh, your talk, and uh, I have learned uh, this uh, narrative economics that's, uh, for, for the first time. Okay. And uh, the second one, of course, is R&D. And then uh, we need uh, some policy instruments and the govern governance models. And I will talk about this one by one, uh, except the first two. Okay, I will skip the first two. Okay, uh, I, uh, from uh, Professor Rain's talk yesterday, he said there are those conditions for reaching uh, 2050 net zero in a democratic and a plural uh, society. And uh, the first one, get the science right. That's, uh, that's, uh, uh, I think that's, uh, we have a good discussion this morning. And then from this one, and I'd, I'd like to add one, that's uh, get the prices right. Uh, get the prices, I think this is, uh, because I'm an economist, I think this is uh, the most important or most fundamental theory in economics, get the price right. Otherwise, everything will be, goes wrong. Okay, how to make the price right? The first one, remove subsidies. We have talked about this many, many times in Taiwan. Okay, other than that, we also need to impose taxes on environmental beds. So, such as a carbon tax, or energy tax or emission tax. Okay, that's what we need. So we need to remove subsidies, a lot of subsidies for water or for land, for fuel, for, for energy, for, for anything. And many, many <laughs> items in Taiwan, including our exchange rate. Our exchange rate, our uh, interest rate, those are macroeconomic uh, instruments, macroeconomic uh, uh, policy are also subsidized in Taiwan a lot for a long time. And then this kind of subsidy make this society, just like uh, Professor Zhou said, this is a brown economy. It's a brown. It's, that's a, that's a, so, okay. Um, how, then let's go to policy instruments. Basically, we talk, we, we hear when we discuss like economic incentive uh, or, or, for, or uh, as, a, as a instrument first, that's a two basic um, principles. One is tax the bad, and the other one is reward good. Tax the bad and reward the good. Uh, this, how to tax the bad, such as carbon tax or energy tax or, 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 for, or ETS. Quantity uh, control with ETS. That's just for climate mitigation, climate change mitigation. And for other kind of uh, pollutants, then we, of course, we need uh, air pollution tax or, or water pollution tax. Okay. 
<clears throat> uh, here, I don't want to go into details about what's the, 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 the to, to, to talk about the uh, major issue in Taiwan, because here, right now in Taiwan, we, have, we don't have carbon tax, we have carbon fee. <laughs> but I want to go to, I would not like to go to in, uh, go into details or to compare or to, 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 to talk about this, uh, what's the difference between the two, what's the consequence of the two. Okay, reward goods is also very important. We use, we should use the revenue from carbon tax very wisely. How to use it? To reward good. There are two goods, two public goods. Two public goods, I think that's the most important for carbon, uh, for, for this uh, climate crisis. Uh, the first one is uh, to use the revenue back, return it back to the people. We call it carbon dividend or, or kind of uh, revenue recycling. Okay, return to the people. And uh, then this one can make people uh, income distribution more equit equitable, equitable, to equalize, uh, to make the income distribution more equitable. The other one is to put the revenue, part of the revenue into a carbon date fund. I think people here no, knows what's uh, remaining carbon budget and will be exhausted in, ten, in, in a decade, in a decade, maybe less than a decade, that's uh, maybe only eight years, will be exhausted. Then after, the, after that, the, the, the emissions will become carbon date. That means the date uh, we, we this generation owe to all our future generations. Then we re need to prepare this money for them to pay for the date. So we need to, uh, to put money into the carbon date. And then for carbon removal, the, the, we have two, 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 two works to be done. One is the carbon re reduction and the other one is carbon removal. Then carbon removal is a kind of a public good. To remove carbon from the atmosphere is a public good. Provide a very important public services for the present generation and the future generation. So we should use the interest and the returns of the fund to buy carbon removal services to pay off the carbon date. Okay, and, uh, this, and so this is like, just like uh, the Norway oil fund. Norway oil fund is, I think it's the, the best sovereign fund based you know, the generated from exhaustible resources. That's uh, oil in the North Sea, from the North Sea. And they put all those revenue into the, the fund and then the, 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 from the beginning, Norway government make a decision that the present generation cannot use this fund. Should left, should, this fund should be left for the future generations. Okay. Okay, the other uh, policy instrument is, uh, is a very conventional command and control and a lot of standards and data, including total quantity control. Total quantity control is what we need in the future for meet, for meeting the net zero target because that's a, that's a total quantity must be, uh, total quantity of emissions should be very, very small. So that's a, we love this total quantity control. We cannot meet that goal. But the total quantity control should be flexible, should be flexible, then that's total quantity control with emission trading system. Okay. Okay, then the last one, the last talk I like, my uh, topic I like to talk is the governance model. I think governance model is very important, not other than policy instruments. We need a governance model. Without a good governance model, those instruments, policy instruments or policy, 
may not be choose, chosen, may not be used, may not be used properly. Yeah, Professor Zhou emphasized governance model. I learned it from you. Okay. Here I like to mention, I like to, to, to raise uh, our attention to this uh, uh, approach, polycentric approach. It is uh, it is suggested by Professor Aline Ostrom. Aline Ostrom is a political science uh, scientist and earned a Nobel Prize in economics in 2009. And after he earned this uh, prize, and the IPCC and the UN asked her for her help. Say we 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 the, the the effort our effort UN's effort for a climate crisis is almost failed. Is almost failed at that time. Say, can you help us? Then he suggests he wrote an article that that's a polycentric approach for climate change. What's a polycentric approach? Approach. Uh, it is simply say it's a, it's a, it's a, it requires active oversight of local, regional, and the national stakeholders at every level to monitor, to oversight ev the, the 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 efforts, our efforts to mitigate the the the, the crisis. So that's the, that's the, uh, on the right hand side. That's the eight design principles for the common property regime. That's the major contribution of uh, Professor Ostrom, and that's why she earned a Nobel Prize. That's uh, just eight. This eight principle, this eight principle, she studied for her life, whole life, from the beginning until. Uh, she, uh, and then the last one, the last one, a the last one of this eight principle, that's a nested enterprises, multi-layer polycentric approach. So it's there for many, many years. And then when she was asked by IPCC, then she suggests polycentric approach. And then what's polycentric from the, the the, the, the diagram on the right hand and left hand side, that's a kind of, we can see that's a, we need every sector, every person, or every country in the different labor, layers of the world must done his own work. And then because the contribution is a public good, Mitigation or definitely the, the contribution of mitigation efforts are public goods. Then people like to be free riders, don't like to put their effort. They, they like to enjoy the, the, the contribution of others. So nobody wants to do enough. So we, that's as she said, in, in the, just like uh, 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 the tragedy of commons. So this is a kind of a tragedy. Of, Strategic commons. The solution is, she said, it's a polycentric system. Actually, it's uh, because uh, she earned, uh, she lists a design principle for the common property region. That's the common, the strategic commons. Okay. Uh, so I like to present several examples of this polycentric approach for the governments. Then. First one is climate crop. I think, what's climate crop? EU is a very good example of a climate crop. It's a group of 27 countries, and then they have a common climate policy, common climate governance. And then every country in EU agree that EU make decision, make decision. And uh, every country follows. So that's uh, 
then by this way, then they can solve, this way can solve the international free rider problem. Free rider problem. And the, so there are several papers on this. And here I like to, to, to here I present my recent paper. In my recent paper, we, we, prepare, we propose four common policy instruments and the programs for a climate club. The first one is a uniform carbon price with revenue neutral recycling. And the second one is a CBM, CBM. The third one is a green club fund. And uh, the last one is the requirements to phase out uh, fossil fuel power generation without CCS by 2050. And the first three is, you know, I, I have, uh, I have uh, discussed and presented the, the first three program uh, in, in the last, few pa la last page. So, okay, that's the, uh, I believe that we put all those programs and then to become a common policy and a program for the club members, then we can uh, solve this problem of free rider free rider problem. That's a very important one. Okay. And then the, and then the green club fund can be used to give the other countries incentive to join the club. Join the club. Otherwise, everybody say, oh, okay, you do your, yourself. And I, 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 I still, uh, I don't want to be a part of the, uh, the, the, the club and uh, only enjoy the, the benefits but we need a club fund to give them incentive. Another incentive is a CBAM. CBAM is a very good incentive to punish those uh, free riders. Okay, for private sector, we also need climate club. Say, climate club in private sector can be solved to the, the free rider problems among firms in a sector. For example, petrochemical in sector, and uh, everyone like to enjoy. You you do yourself, and I don't want to do. So there are several. There are here. There are several examples of this kind of uh, private sector climate club, and uh, and that's what we need in Taiwan. What we need in Taiwan, but uh, up to now, they, it's uh, it's uh, uh, I, I, I actually I have made some effort last year, but no success. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for Professor Shao's detailed suggestions. Uh, some ideas like uh, polycentric uh, governance, uh, ta general Taiwanese people are not so familiar with this, uh, uh, this concept, but surely it's uh, uh, really critical for a more uh, comprehensive and uh, impactful uh, institutional arrangement in Taiwan. So uh, for that, maybe uh, later we can take some time to discuss about that. Okay, then uh, um, the, the next panelist, let's invite Professor Lu. Okay, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm the last, but probably not the least. I'm also very happy uh, to be behind uh, Professor Dai because uh, 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 Professor Xiao Dai Ji, he is an economist and I am a sociologist and he is for uh, subsidize is bad and I probably I will propose subsidize is probably good. But the, <laughs> the, 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 the problem I will argue is uh, because as a social policy uh, expert, I would argue in my presentation today, uh, I want to send you uh, two messages. The first one is, uh, well, in the, uh, 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 in, in the process of uh, uh, to the net zero, uh, net zero uh, transformation goal, uh, it is uh, also about inequality and to minimize uh, and to make this uh, transformation more uh, smooth, where social policy uh, is good. So I, am, I say the melon, and I say melon is very sweet, and my social, uh, so economic solution is probably is through social policy. But I'm partly also agree with uh, Professor uh, Xiao. I, I think he uh, he is right. Uh, I think when we talk about subsidies, we we have to uh, distinguish between subsidies of what. I'm I will I I am I'm against. I I I think price is is absolutely good. But the problem is uh, 
uh, we also need to look at some target group, particularly where some unwilling uh, social classes in this, prop, uh, in this process, and probably we have to find a clever, subsidized way to help uh, the uh, vulnerable or the disadvantaged group. Point one, point two, I want to argue that uh, the social policy could help this transformation process more smooth without uh, riots or social, <laughs> or social uh, 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 protests to make this uh, 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 process more uh, smooth. So this is probably my, uh, 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 my argument in this uh, presentation. So uh, I will first of all, I have some problems uh, setting my theoretical and some policy tools and uh, my preliminary uh, conclusion. Well, the first one is, I, 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 was, I will say well, the problem is, well, net zero is of course good, but the problem is, uh, this is, well, at least for Taiwan, it's probably an imposed goal from outside, particularly for a very, very fast gr uh, growing uh, economy, NICS. And I think, well, EU is, a, of course, is a common good. It's a common good uh, uh, for, for reducing uh, this carbon or remove the carbon. But the problem is uh, some of our economic development goal could be, uh, could be uh, 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 affected. And also uh, some social inequality problem could also uh, be a, a problem. And it also refer not only to the old, but it also create some problem of new social inequality. So I, I, I think uh, we, have, we have also talk about many, many uh, articles talk about the so-called energy poverty, particularly for some uh, uh, households. So here, uh, I would try to argue, well, here we, uh, in, in our, in our uh, two days uh, 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 conference, we talk about uh, supply side, but also we have also demand side. And in the supply side, we talk about many, many firms in terms of uh, some car high carbon industry, but also high, uh, uh, high tech uh, industry, but also some in informal uh, in economy. This is on the one hand is uh, 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 for the firm, but also for the workers. Some, we also have uh, the problem of the dual uh, labor market uh, uh, in this process. This is, uh, we, ho we, have to concern, uh, we have to consider in the uh, production side, but we also have in the uh, uh, demand side, uh, we have uh, the glo uh, some market which is global, but we have also the local. And here, the very important thing is the consumption. Uh, we have two points. The first one is uh, different household, different household structure uh, divide, uh, divided by their income level or their regions uh, could, could be quite differentiated. Well, some paper, uh, some article have already, already uh, pointed out the top 10 uh, uh, rich people, they consume uh, more than uh, uh, 30 or, 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 or 40 uh, uh, carbon. Where is the... Uh, 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 the, pay, uh, 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 the worst of uh, income group, they have to pay for uh, 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 this price. And also, uh, uh, Dr. Huang has also talked about some of their consumption, consumption uh, behavior across or by the different income group. So this is uh, probably from sociological perspective, we have to, uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, make a point. And so here I argue uh, social policy could be very, very helpful for uh, overcoming some of this social inequality problem during this, uh, 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 this transformation process. And, but we have to consider uh, at least four, uh, uh, four factors. The first one is our uh, political regime. The second one is international political econom economic regime. The third is our production. And the last but not the, the least is our labor regime. And I think these four pillars must be, uh, uh, as a, as must be considered to strengthen uh, our social policy regime to help uh, our transformation process to this uh, net zero uh, 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 goal. And I argue that in, in Taiwan, well, we, we, we say Taiwan's social policy is a so-called productivist. And I argue uh, in this transformation process, Taiwan has to develop another uh, social policy state. I call it the social investment state. And this social investment state uh, 
can be a, can be a, a solution from a macro uh, perspective for smooth, uh, uh, for helping Taiwan to transform into, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to get this, uh, 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 this goal as, uh, uh, successful. And here, well, this is a little bit complicated, but <laughs> I argue that here is from this uh, climate, uh, climate change uh, 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 goal, and lastly, to the transformation of, of, our, so, of our social policy, uh, as a just transformation, we need to take into consideration two points. The one is our labor market, and the second one is our tax system. And three very important. So I argue, uh, I also agree with uh, 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 Professor uh, Shaw in terms of tax. And I think this is probably uh, very important now in Taiwan right now and also in the coming in, in the coming years the first one is uh, as you uh, suggest some uh, some energy tax and the second one i personally i propose to lift our vat because now in taiwan our vat is only 5% and i i propose to lift our our vat gradually well like the uh, the case of japan gradually to 8% and then 10%, and then we can have, we can collect a so-called, a so-called uh, 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 fund. And this fund can be financed for, for helping Taiwan's transformation to this goal. So this is uh, what I propose in this. So, uh, well, uh, we, we have two, uh, uh, two sources of, of fund. The, the, first one, the first one is uh, just VAT, and another one is uh, 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 energy tax. But VAT is, uh, of course, is, uh, is widely, it, it could be, it, it must be paid, all the population, but the energy call, uh, but ener uh, energy tax is a uh, uh, user, user, uh, user uh, tax. And another one is, well, here is, uh, we, uh, we have three constitu uh, but uh, we, have, we have three institutions. The first one is uh, our political institution, namely uh, the party. The second one is labor market institution, uh, I, I mean, more uh, the trade union. And the third is our interest intermediation institution. So I argue here, uh, well, in the last panel, we talked about uh, 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 citizen participation, but I argue here more important is organized, organized citizens uh, participation form via political party and the trade union and also uh, organized interest group to, uh, to push this tax reform and this labor market reform. And here I, uh, I compare, well, uh, quite different uh, countries, US, uh, Netherlands, uh, uh, and, and also Taiwan, in addressing some of this uh, social economic change. And I think here the very important thing, which is uh, quite related to my argument is this labor demand measures and measures to help the unemployed to find work. So this is probably also what I differentiate with uh, Professor, uh, 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 Professor Shaw. I argue if we, can, if we can identify some of the regions or some of the sectors, some uh, vulnerable groups or some workers has been laid off during this uh, transformation, then, then the government is is, has this obligation to help these workers to go back to a new job. And what they need, they need is uh, to update their skill. So I mean here, uh, some of the labor demand majors say job subsidize, recruitment incentive, and public job creation. And some majors, I, I call it active labor market policy, LMP, is important for addressing this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, unemployment or some problem, uh, poverty, uh, energy uh, 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 poverty problem caused by this transformation process. And the money, the, fun, the, the money, what is needed, will be, well, uh, should be financed as I, what I suggest, well, the tax, the VAT and also the energy uh, tax. So this is uh, uh, my, 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 uh, uh, my idea 
Okay, and here I also argue what actually in Taiwan's social policy, we have uh, many, many forms. We have uh, social insurance, uh, social assistance, welfare, et cetera, et cetera. But from this uh, uh, figure, you can see in Taiwan, I think also similar to other many, many countries, is our, most of our subsidies is, uh, is in cash. And I argue what more, very important is, is LMP. So, I mean, more uh, job, uh, uh, job creation and some uh, 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 skill transformation, uh, uh, the, uh, the skill, uh, the skill, uh, 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 the world retraining program. And this is what Taiwan need during this process. So once again, I, I would add, I'm partly uh, agree with uh, Professor, uh, P P Professor Shaw. I, I, I think uh, uh, sub uh, uh, price is, of course, is, is, is correct, but I think from the perspective of social policy experts, I, I would say well, subsidies should also be, uh, should also be feasible and also necessary, at least in, in this process. So, uh, sorry, this is uh, in Chinese, and I also argue that from the perspective of the, of the uh, 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 this is, uh, we also have to, uh, to approach this problem from uh, some micro perspective, and this is a so-called life course, life course uh, 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 pass from, for uh, workers or for a uh, uh, vulnerable house, uh, uh, household group, and I would suggest well, some, uh, some, uh, some measures for guaranteeing uh, or to help them uh, for, uh, uh, for this process. So, uh, as uh, some implication is, I, uh, I think uh, three points should be pointed out. The, the first one, this is a very, very good chance for Taiwan to, uh, to consider our political economy essence. It's probably also uh, the viewpoint I share with uh, uh, Mr. <laughs> uh, Deputy, Deputy Minister, I mean, well, this is a very good chance for Taiwan to transform our political economy. I mean, uh, Taiwan has been very fervent for its uh, very, very uh, uh, small, medium uh, firms, and also its, uh, uh, its uh, uh, some print of uh, political economy. But I think this uh, just, this uh, uh, climate change could offer Taiwan a very good chance to transform our, the quality, the quantity and or quality of our political economy from a developmental state now to another form. I call it social investment. And the second one is just probably also a good way for, uh, for East Asian countries. But here, very important thing is uh, political strategy. I argue here we, we need to form a progressive coalition against a uh, conservative. Uh, I mean, here is uh, we have we, we should find some coordination between the middle class and some urban striver. I define urban striver as uh, uh, particularly uh, the one who move the, the, the young guy who move from rural to the urban. And uh, well, they are they are more uh, now uh, very young, but economic uh, economic uh, economically uh, worse off. And I think probably they should be the target group for this project. So, uh, this is so far I finish uh, my, uh, my, uh, my presentation. And once again, I argue that the social policy, uh, a, a well-designed social policy uh, measures could be a good solution for this, uh, 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 this uh, net zero uh, 2050 goals. Thank you. Thank you so much for Professor, uh, Professor Liu's suggestion, social investment state. Uh, I think that's a new uh, narrative for Taiwan society transforming toward a net zero society. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, now uh, uh, let's invite the uh, suggestions, dialogue, or uh, feedback from our audience. Okay, <laughs> Deputy Minister Dean. I think so. I'm very happy to uh, to know that uh, gender 
uh, proposed uh, social investment. And I would like to correct that as uh, social investment is not a new concept in Taiwan, at least not for the gender, but it's recently become more visible, right? So this is a good thing uh, to see that. And also, this is uh, why we invited, uh, uh, I think, the economics to the Tai Chi and also our gender to join our net zero uh, the conference. Uh, we actually, so we mentioned yesterday uh, already, uh, I think so in the session of the just transition, and we saw uh, a lot of weak points in, in economic and social ground. So because uh, inequality and so on, and a weakness of the social uh, security system. And exactly, so I think that we can use a common ground, a common purpose, a common, uh, a common goal uh, of the net zero to leverage the power to improve our, uh, I think, so our original uh, social structure and also economic structure. But I think so exactly touched the point. I think so we also uh, mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, they discussed it yesterday. Just a brief comment on that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next. Dr. Zhang, <laughs> you are looking at me. <laughs> yeah, because I just posted a question on Slido, so, but I, I can use the chance to ask in person. Uh, because regarding to the carbon pricing, I just find out that the uh, uh, Dr. Liston have published a paper talk about uh, maybe some limitation of the carbon carbon pricing last year. And uh, but the professor Shaw emphasized the importance of the carbon pricing in terms of the net zero transition. So I would like to invite the uh, I would like to ask if the uh, Dr. Livingston can talk uh, more about what's in his perspective on his observation of the of the uh, carbon carbon pricing, which was already implemented in EU for uh, at least 15 years. What kind of limitation we should watch out since we will begin begin uh, our program next uh, maybe next two years. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, this question goes to Professor Livingston. Uh, so, Professor, yes. uh, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, that that someone is actually reading our, our work. It's always it's always very flattering when someone even knows the name of our articles. Mm -hmm. So, but I think I think it's it, it's an important thing. I mean, what what, what Dr. Shaw presented okay, is good. sort of the same kind of discussion that we have within the economics yeah. circles and environmental economic circles in Europe as well. But it is also relatively void of, of empirics, because the effects that, that Dr. Shaw and with him, I would say 90% of other environmental economists as well, expect, we, we just cannot see them. Right? It doesn't happen that way. And I think there are two big things that, that we need to consider that happen in the real world, but don't happen in the textbook and then happen in these economic models. And I mean, <clears throat> we, we heard we need to get prices right. And that's a statement that of course, we need to get prices right, but it will only be helpful for the systemic change that is needed if prices are the actual barrier. If prices are not the actual barrier, then we can get the prices right, or maybe they are right, or, or, or what do I know, but it's not going to solve a problem. And we saw in my talk, for example, wind power is already cheaper than fossil fuel, so in, in that sense, prices are already right, but we don't get wind power because prices are not the barrier. There are barriers in permission processes, there are barriers in the infrastructure with the fit to the market system, and so on. And so, on. so get prices right seems like a logical thing, and no one can really oppose that, but it's not really the issue in very many of the, of the things that we oppose. And the, the other point that I also heard here um, is we, we need to tax the bad and reward the good. And with taxing the bad, I, 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 I'm not sure what, what the point of that is, because what we see is that the carbon pricing as it exists works as a phase-out policy. It penalizes the things that we don't want, but it has not, at least not so far, triggered the types of effect that we need. It doesn't phase in the new things, but it does phase out things if the new technologies have already been in place. For example, in the UK, we see that because they had such a big gas power fleet, adding a carbon floor price 
essentially killed off coal. But in other countries where we also see high, where we see carbon prices, that has not happened simply because there is no alternative. So, so that is, it, it's really important to, to figure out what is really the systemic effect that I'm going to work and what is the effect that I anticipate to get in each of these systems. The last point, you need to consider the politics uh, of, of these things. It turns out to be excessively difficult to really put a tax in place so as to trigger deep systemic change. Because you create a lot of losers, you create high and very visible costs to powerful actors. And that appears to be really a, a big showstopper in most cases, because apart from the European uh, emission trading scheme, no, no taxation system has really managed to, to do so. And I'm, I'm ready to, to take the, uh, the objections to that, that there are prices, high prices in Uruguay and in Sweden and Switzerland and so on, but, but let's talk. The politics of this turns out to be really hard. If you really want change, then subsidies and support, positive incentives, appear to be much more conducive than the negative incentives of penalizing what you don't want. Okay, thank you. And then, okay, yeah, Professor Ren. All right, thank you very much, also, Johan, for your uh, contribution at the last minute. I would like to even point it a little bit stronger, and I would like really to get our two economists to respond to this. We have two possibilities in terms of monetary incentive. One is to tax the bad thing or to subsidize the good thing. And basically, they have the same, or more or less the same result. If you tax the bad thing, what you're doing basically is to make sure that these things are you know, being discouraged. But as a side effect, you have a lot of acceptance problems. Uh, subsidizing the good normally everybody loves. And secondly, you have a lot of redistributive effects because very often this kind of taxation will penalize those who have no substitutes and that are usually the poor. If you do the other, if you support the um, the good and, and subsidize the goods um, is accept. You, it's, it's much more accepted, but you probably have to raise taxes in order to pay for it. Now, the issue is the distributive effect of taxes depends on your progressive tax system. So if you have a very well-developed uh, progressive tax system, that could be really equitable. And you could see, well, maybe there is, a, you know, I know old economists hate to put subsidies on something, but maybe in that kind of comparison you can see whether it may be better at least to have a mix of both. And the second question I have relates again to what, what Johan was saying. Um, a lot of these incentives rely on an existing functioning governance and a flexibility of the market. Uh, there's one thing I just can tell you about Germany. We made a, 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 a totally silly experiment and said, if you would give all heat pumps in Germany for free, just give them for free, we would not have a good diffusion because there are not as many heat pumps available and there is hardly anyone who can install them. Now, there are some, but not enough. So even if there was no money involved, if you would uh, out them for free, it would take years for the market actually to be able to meet the demand. And so the question is how much in terms of infrastructure development and conditional development is necessary to have these economic instruments actually work as they're supposed to work. And I don't know how that is in Taiwan. Maybe you have you know, enough labor and enough uh, skilled workers here that can deal with the the, the peak and the demand very quickly, but at least in Germany, that's not the case. And that is something where we are you know, really highly worried. So those are the two questions I would like to raise. Okay, for Professor Ren's uh, questions or comments, uh, Professor Xiao, would, would you like to respond to them? Okay, uh, let me uh, just give a brief response uh, to to Rem and uh, Professor Lidi uh, Stan. But uh, I'm sorry, uh, P Professor Lidi Stan, I, I, it's very hard for me to 
to comprehend uh, what you have uh, you, you you have said uh, because it's the noisy. Yeah, I, I, it's very hard for me. But I know you are talking about tax, talking about price. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, first, price is right. is uh, is not the only policy. It's not the only one, but it's a must. It is a must. If we have a lot of command control without a pricing policy, then the the, the consequence or the impacts or the effects will be much much smaller. That's the first thing. The second one is uh, tax the bad, reward the good. Is of course tax the bad is to internalize externalities. Okay, to make uh, uh, people feel. Uh, to pay for the, the pollution of or just just like carbon pricing, pay for the pr carbon emissions. Otherwise, we'll emit too much, uh, too much. That's uh, not we, not everyone. We'll emit too much. But so that's why we are talking about carbon pricing, and then it is uh, this policy. Our uh, uh, there are many forms of carbon pricing. They are adopted by many many countries. But in Taiwan, it's very slow, very very slow. Maybe last in the last we have talked about this maybe in the last 20 years, but no progress until this year we finally revised the law, climate law, and add one article. Not only are there several articles about carbon fee. It's called carbon fee, not carbon tax. There is a big difference between carbon fee and carbon tax, but I, I don't want to go to in, go into detail about the, the difference here in this uh, this uh, short uh, talk. But everyone here in Taiwan knows that. Okay, and but I'd like to emphasize that uh, many of us, such as Professor Zhou and I and others, we are now advocate to have carbon tax instead of carbon fee. That's what we are working right now with many environmental NGOs in Taiwan. More than 20 NGOs join. Uh, we have, uh, we, we form a union to do that. Okay. The second part of the, uh, of this uh, pricing system is reward good. There are two, two kinds of goods. The first one is carbon removal is a kind of goods. We need to pay for that. Who pay? Who pay? The government pay. Because it is a public goods, so the government should pay. The government need to collect tax to pay. Uh, collect the best source of tax is polluters. Emission. That means from now on, every emission, every carbon or GHG emission emitters is responsible for remove, remove. He emit one unit or one ton of CO2 into the air, then they, he has the obligation to remove that in the future. That's his obligation. That's a kind of a new idea. Otherwise, in the past, okay, he paid the tax, that's enough. Then he still emit, he paid the tax. For his emission, then that's all. That's that. Then he fulfill his obligation. That's not enough right now, because of net zero policy, net zero goal. Without net zero, then that's okay. You you emit and you pay. You emit. That's all. Now it's not enough. So you need to pay enough for future for the carbon removal in the future. That's uh, otherwise, how can government get enough money? Or say, Professor, just like Professor Liu said, to raise the VAT tax rate to from 5% to 10%. Then that's a way, that's the only way, just like in Japan, that's the only way they raise uh, government revenue. That's the only way in Japan. Yeah. Or in other countries, but not in Taiwan. We have enough room for carbon tax, enough room for energy tax, 
That's because in the past, our energy price is much, much lower than that in Japan. Our energy, energy price, for example, uh, gasoline, is only around half of that price in Japan. The difference, the difference is made of energy tax. Energy tax. They have a high energy tax already, and we don't have. So we have a lot of room. We have a lot of room. Yeah. And the other one is to use the revenue to return to the people in order to equalize the income distribution. That's also important because energy tax, carbon tax, and the VAT will penalize the poor. All of them penalize the poor. Penalize make income distribution much inequitable. Yeah, so that's, uh, of course, we need uh, a lot of investment, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of uh, administrative uh, capacity to build, uh, to, for building, to build, in, to build. That's, a lot of things must be done, but I, we don't want to go to talk about here, but just I'd like to say something key some key, po key, key policy instruments. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Professor Zhou. Yeah, in order, uh, I will leave earlier in order to uh, pick up my, my next generation, yeah, due to typhoon, yeah, to pick my, my, my doctor in the kindergarten, okay? So to maintain her the intergenerational justice, okay? So I would like, I, I would like to ask uh, gender you propose to enhance the social investment. Let me, uh, take, uh, uh, let me say, actually, the, uh, at the beginning of the, this year, I published one article to analyze why Taiwan actually lost the uh, window opportunity of three times energy tax, 2006, 2009, and the 2015. Professor Xiao is one of the law at that, at that time. So in this article, I actually uh, analyzed the, the paradigm shift yeah, difficulty uh, from, uh, from economy to green e e economy. Yeah. Very low electricity price, low labor price, low water price. Yeah, and uh, yeah, low, yeah, so it's uh, actually, it's, uh, we, we Yesterday we discussed a, a, a lot of that, but Jen, you, I want to know uh, details. Of what is your idea about the social investment? Because, you know, in Taiwan, uh, by the net zero, although we like to say after COVID-19, we have a lot of a, a lot of invisible, yeah, vulnerable group, yeah, who need actually engaged. Okay. And the, only by the uh, net zero, we know that uh, uh, related to just transition, as you mentioned, the uh, energy poverty and uh, the, you know, the, 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 the affected group by the uh, net zero transportation and uh, also the, the affected labor by the, uh, you know, by the transition of high carbon manufacturing industry yeah, in Taiwan. And we also have the, uh, over the 1.6 million uh, small, uh, middle and small enterprise. In between, we have the uh, 106,000 uh, 106, uh, middle small yeah, enterprise who belong to global supply chain. And the, in your idea, of what kinds of clear social investment? This is also uh, related to Professor Xiao's uh, social climate fund to the yeah, just transition. You, you are in the cabinet, so please urge more about the carbon tax, not only carbon fee. This is actually not enough. I can tell you because the carbon fee is uh, put into the uh, GHG fund, yeah, this is not well uh, distributed to different uh, ministries. So please, yeah, maybe, may, may okay. 
Okay, Professor Lee, please. And uh, because we have only 10 minutes left, so uh, okay. could you uh, express your suggestions uh, just briefly? Thank okay, you. Okay, 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 thank you very much. Uh, and um, also, thank, uh, thank you very much for uh, Professor Zhou's uh, uh, question. Uh, so, uh, my, my point is three. The first one is, uh, well, actually, as uh, uh, Professor Lin has uh, indicated, this idea of so-called social investment state is actually nothing, uh, is nothing new in, uh, in Europe, but it's probably new in Taiwan, and it is uh, designed for addressing the traditional social inequality problem. And it is good for Taiwan in the first sense, where traditionally our Social policy is very targeted, targeted at elderly and very, very cash transfer, not invest in, so in human capital, particularly the women, the children, uh, the child, and the young guy. So in the first very, very first sense, the social investment idea is actually to address the traditional social inequality problem, point one. But as we in indicated, now, well, my idea is actually quite similar like Germans, uh, Germany's, uh, uh, Germany's experience during 2000, uh, 2006 or 2004. At that time, you have uh, the red-green uh, red coalition. So, I mean, this problem, uh, social investment should not only uh, address, not only set out to uh, address the traditional social inequality problem, but also the new social inequality caused by the climate change. So I add this so-called, uh, 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 as, uh, as Professor Shaw uh, suggests, this climate, climate uh, 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 fund. So, I mean, the, the first one is uh, to address the, the, uh, the old social inequality, but also the new social inequality problem. And the third, very important, thank you very much for your mentioning. I think in this process, particularly, well, I think for Taiwan very particular is our social and medium enterprises. And I personally, I personally, I, I think they could not be affordable for this change. And it could create very massive uh, unemployment, unemployment problem, particularly in some uncompetitive sector for example, in Kaohsiung, in Gangshan, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this, this fund should be also uh, gathered as a, um, um, as a guarantee for guarantee this transformation much more smooth. And this is probably what DPP should learn in the failure of the, the last election. So in this sense, social policy should be designed as a safeguard for, for, uh, for helping this uh, transformation process more smooth. So it is not only economically, economically but also politically uh, uh, important. And this is also what I argue in the cabinet, but I'm still a minority. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Professor Lin. Uh, I'd like to add a few points to, to echo uh, genders. I think uh, the social investment or the social policy is not only a, a so-called uh, the bottom line policy, but also a driving force, a potential driving force for an innovation for the new. Because innovation always causes instability of the society. And that is what we uh, discussed yesterday so about uh, a society we use the word stability and the resilience. We discussed the, the dialogue between the resilience and, the, and stability. Instead of the stability, I used the, the word of the inertia of the, this uh, society. And inertia of the, this society, in particular in the, in the sector of the economic, of the mass production, and uh, so-called the manufacturing sector is a mass production cost down, as you mentioned. You, you forget that a very important factor is a low salary not only the low uh, 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 energy uh, price, but also low salary. So the, all of that is to prevent uh, innovation or a dynamic evaluation of the society. And that exactly, exactly prevent we are forward 
to the to the net zero. I make the, everything very short. So, okay, but this is a complicated uh, the process. So that's why I yesterday emphasized that you need to also to go back to see your ground, your social ground, your your political ground, and to make the the suitable ground for the net zero approach. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, one last uh, question uh, online. Uh, because someone asked, when employing narrative to establish trust, how can we prevent favoring the privileged? Okay, I think maybe this question goes to Dr. Huang Leifman. Yeah, so thank you for this question. I want to differentiate the difference between uh, co-creating narratives and telling na narratives. So when I meant this co-creating process, I mean the process in a society, how do we engage in being really inclusive, especially targeting on, they say, the poor, the need, in this inclusive process. And we have to make sure that these people, they are in this process of co-creating this narrative with us. And when we have this kind of consensus or co-creating narrative as an end product, and maybe the policymaker would like to communicate this end product narrative, then we as scientists, as a policymaker, have to learn how to tell a compelling story. We have to learn from those uh, that have the, the, the key characteristic and to have the main characters. So these are the two, two different tasks we have to do, co-creating narrative, being really inclusive, make sure we include the one that are not just the privileged, but really the one who need to be taken care of in these social economic policies. And then that's uh, different from the telling, telling the stories or telling the narratives to communicate uh, the policy outcome or the policy uh, at the later phase. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, we are running out of, out of time. So uh, allow me to close today's uh, discussion. I think uh, today, uh, all the, the four panelists ha have suggested um, uh, abundant policy, policy instruments, and uh, narratives. So let's keep in mind, uh, I think all these suggestions will be very helpful for Taiwan and also for Germany, for Europe. Thank you. Thank you, and also thank you everyone on site and online for joining us on this two-day journey. Uh, we hope you have heard or experienced something in these two days that gave you something new to think about, and that the connections started here will grow into conversations or new collaborations. So uh, here we are now at the end of the event, and we'd like to welcome our TSS chairman and also Deputy Minister Lin Min Song to give us a closing remark. So I try to make the, the difficult closing remark very short. Uh, I think it's almost impossible to make the, a conclusion or conclusive uh, comment uh, in the overall discussion uh, in the last two days. Uh, I think that the time is very short. Uh, in this morning, I think that we even, we even spent uh, 15 minutes to find how to identify the problem, only how to identify the problem, or how should uh, uh, identify the problem uh, uh, for the process and so on. We spent, I think, 15 minutes. Uh, we, we haven't yet started to uh, discuss the problem itself. I think the time is important. And I, we heard a lot of keywords in uh, these two days, uh, for example, human. I think that I heard uh, uh, the human twice uh, from the Thomas. Okay, we are human, okay? So this is a fact, but usually we forget that human is a very complex uh, biolog biological existence, right? Uh, the, the society is also uh, composed by the human, it's also complex. So basically, uh, in principle, we are, it's almost impossible to get some consensus. I think that we got the last almost impossible to consensus is our consensus in the, this morning. So then, uh, we may uh, receive the, the question or the problem of the society or the, the whole world in a different way. So I try to bring it this way. So I think that we mentioned about the transdisciplinary and also the multi-dimension, so we mentioned, and even the multi-layer. 
A multi-layer is a very important physical structure. I think that we heard uh, from the presentation from, I forget from who, uh, yeah, from, yeah, you mentioned the multi-layer. So the multi-layer is one of the physical structure of the multi-layer. So that means that we can build up the very complex structure. And, and here I uh, also I like to use a word that you use uh, the, the narrative. Uh, narratives actually you need to read the text. You see the picture and so on. You got the story. Uh, because uh, I, I love music, so why I, I go to I went to the Germany's. I like to use uh, uh, the example of the music of Bach. I think that you know the, the I think that someone mentioned the polycentric, uh, the idea of polycentric, and I think that with a beautiful uh, picture, the polycentric. I would like to mention the, the polyphony. Uh, polyphony is uh, you hear is not only one melody, so actually it's uh, a lot of melody uh, running away together. Uh, but don't forget that they are correlated. They are independent, but correlated. Uh, so we call this as a counterpoint. I think it's a Dui Wei Hua. So I, I really, uh, I think everyone uh, loves the music, uh, or the, particularly from Bach, know what I'm talking about. So I cannot play here right now. So the counterpart is actually is, uh, we can run in, in the same time, many. Uh, Melody, not only four parts, many four, many uh, many parts, but however, in some sense, we have some correlation. The correlation can be changed, but we have a point to point. Uh, we care about each other, I think, so, but we are independent. Uh, I think the net zero is a, a kind of the a process. We need to find some counterpart music. We can run. You forget. You go back to the Germany. You can run away. But actually, we have some certain connection. It's also here, the social sciences and also the economics that can, can, can correlate it in your sleeping, uh, uh, even uh, because of our uh, discussion today. Uh, I think that is, if you can, this can happen, then, then we are successful, at least from the first uh, uh, step. Uh, in reality, we are working very hard, in particular with our social science group. Uh, we meet us uh, recently, uh, I, I beg, uh, not a request, I beg, uh, we, we can meet us uh, uh, once uh, two weeks to really to discuss uh, how is the correlation to our, the, the policy running time uh, roadmap. Yeah, because you know, on the one hand, uh, the policy overall, the government uh, uh, action is, uh, is running very fast. On the other hand, we really need to take time to discuss some fundamental concepts. So how can we do that? So on the one hand, we need to work hard. On the other hand, we need to be relaxed. So this is very complex. This is a counterpart. This is the beauty of the counterpart. So I, I really, um, I think, so appreciate you all uh, again. So uh, in the future, I think uh, we can, on the one hand, uh, to enjoy the music of Bach and also enjoy the complicated uh, relation uh, in the counterpoint. That's it so why. And, and finally, of course, we can build up a, a teamwork, a, a, a common uh, work, a common job to solve the problem uh, net zero. Uh, OK, this is uh, my uh, closing remark. Thank you very much. Uh, OK, yeah. And also enjoy uh, your stay in Taiwan. OK, good. <laughs> I, I finished my job. I'm, I'm quite relaxed. <laughs>
呃，新盛，新盛 actually， 呃、uh, ，award in Chinese 苦、uh, 主 ，I I don't know 苦主 ，how can I translate？ 苦主 is、uh, usually we have new idea and someone need to do that， right？ And that person is 苦主，苦主 is a、uh, can 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 you can you explain？ The 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 poorest the the poorest one the, the actually. <laughs> Uh, doing the job, yes, uh, okay. So let's thank the, also our our Xin Sheng uh, again. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you. Just uh, two little things to mention before you go. Uh, the first one is uh, it would make us extremely happy if you could go to the back of the room and sign your name or doodle on our interactive board. And the second one, to, just to mention the reuse of plastic, reducement of plastic. The name badge, please leave it on the front desk on your way out. But of course, you can keep the card in it, which has a QR code that will lead to our website. Again, we are the Taiwan Sustainability Hub and staff of the pilot project of the social scientific research for Taiwan Net Zero Batteries. <laughs> okay, hope we see each other more in the future towards Net Zero. Thank you all and have a safe trip home.